Welcome to Capital One Bowl Mania. You're watching the Belk Bowl as part of Capital One Bowl Mania. The sun is out in Charlotte, North Carolina. The Deacons on his motorcycle and Wake Forest from just down the road in Winston-Salem battles with Texas A&M out of the SEC on a lovely Friday in the Queen City of North Carolina. Thanks for joining us once again, Jason Benetti, Kelly Stauffer, Chris Budden down on the sideline. And it seems like we have two options in college football and bowl season right now. Either a team's on the way up or a team's got a new coach coming in. That, that's a great point. The contrast that you get in bowl season is this. You have Wake Forest, a team that's coming out of really four years of rebuilding and reaping the rewards of that on the field today. And then you have Texas A&M. Someone is out. Jimbo Fisher is in. And you have a lot of student athletes wondering what comes next. And Jimbo Fisher will join us coming up later on. As for Wake Forest, the team on the way up, John Wolford, the quarterback, has had a marvelous year. Unbelievable. In all of my days of covering college football, I've never seen a turnaround like this. On a personal level, a quarterback that is doing most everything right. When Wake Forest committed to going fast on the field, this young man has been absolutely lights out. The run pass option, 90 plus plays a game, and they're getting after it day in and day out. And this graphic kind of summarizes what I just said. Three years of 30 touchdown passes, 35 interceptions, and this year he flipped the script. 25 TDs, only six picks. That's extraordinary. So how did this happen, Chris Button? Well, coming out of spring practice, John Mulford wasn't even the number one quarterback. Dave Clark and announcing that Kendall Hinton, who got injured the previous year, would get the first team reps. Well, John told me that, frankly, he was angry. He didn't want to spend his senior year sitting on the sidelines watching. So over the offseason, he was meticulous watching film with his footwork and his mechanics. He said that added on with this is the healthiest he's ever been, has added to such a successful season. Chris, thank you. It's his last game of his career. In meantime, for Texas A&M, it's the last game under many of these coaches. A house money day for the Aggies, huh? No kidding. Huh? And no Mazzoni's the offensive coordinator, play caller. He was my coach in college, and I know exactly what he's going to do. He's going to empty the bucket here today, and he's going to keep his eye on Christian Kirk, number three, NFL receiver. We do not know yet officially whether he's going to go to the NFL next year or not, but I guarantee you this. There are going to be a lot of touches built for number three today. And no Mazzoni, the play caller for an AM, is going to pull out all the stops here this afternoon. All the stops? All the stops. Like, if I got it, I'm going to use it, right? Absolutely. He's going to empty the bucket. There isn't any question about it. And I don't think he, I don't know that he's going to do that necessarily from out of the gate, but get into the second and third series as his young men get settled down a little bit. It's going to be interesting to see what he calls. The Demon Deacons were here 10 years ago, and they were the bulk of a 53,000-person crowd. Today, a little bit lighter in terms of overall attendance, but still a lot of black and gold out there. And with Christian Kirk back as one of the guys that's deep to fill this ball for Texas A&M, do not go to the refrigerator right now because that man is explosive. Belt Bowl 2017 is underway. This is Travion Williams on the return for Texas A&M. And a nice run up to the 30-yard line. So we say hello to the redshirt freshman Nick Starkle, who had the ankle injury in quarter number three against UCLA. He is back for that injury. And we're talking to the interim head coach, Jeff Banks, and he said, look, when we got him back, the son of a Navy nurse and an Army officer, when we got him back, we thought, oh, boy, Nick's back. Everything's going to change. He's only played a couple of quarters <laughs> yeah. in his career. Yeah, UCLA, he had two quarters, and he was lighting it up in those two quarters, but then a broken ankle, and he set out for eight games. Starkle to throw on first down, and he overthrows Christian Kirk, the young man you were talking about, the future NFL player. And Jason, what we're going to see today out of Texas A&M is Noah Mazzoni is at the epicenter of what they play in college football these days. Go fast. 
pass, the RPOs, the quarterback reads, and try to get to about 90 plays in this game. That's the kind of pace they're going to play with today. To the outside, quick hitter for Jamon Osmond, his 39th grab. And if Wake Forest's defense faces 75 snaps today, they will have faced the most plays from scrimmage than any other defense in the FBS. They've been on the field a lot this year. Christian Kirk will need to break some tackles and can't do it. Wake Forest finishes him off. Amari Henderson with the stop along with Jesse Bates, the safety. And here's an early decision for the interim head coach for Texas A&M, Jeff Banks, is coming up short here, fourth and maybe a long one. Does he roll the dice early in this one? It looks like he's going to punt the ball away. We asked him about this very situation yeah. yesterday, and he said fourth down and three or so from our own 40, we probably won't, but they do want to have the ball in their hands as much as possible in the first half because of some defensive thinness that we'll talk about when Wake has the ball. Tribuca's punt to Jesse Bates drives him to the 15-yard line. All right, let's take a, take a look at today's key to the game brought to you by Franklin American Mortgage Company. Yeah, and you talked about the pace in which these offenses are going to play, and I think today it's the first team to 90 plays might win this game. And then A&M, their receivers literally number two, number three, and number four against Wake's secondary, by the way, ironically or whatever you may call it, that secondary number two, number three, and number four, that collective matchup is probably going to go a long way to deciding how this game plays out. Wake Forest, one of the fastest tempos in the FBS, led by Wolford, and this is a run up the middle for Matt Colburn. Kate Carney, the starting running back, is dinged up some, or at least the guy who came into the year is starting. Colburn will likely get most of the touches today. Wolford behind his man. It's incomplete for Tabari Hines in third down, but John Wolford, more interceptions than touchdowns, not only for his career, but in each of his yeah. first three seasons coming into this year. Dave Clawson raved about his intelligence when we chatted yesterday. Wolford has to run, and he is dropped behind the 20-yard line. Landis Durham from the defensive end spot with the hit and punt time for Wake Forest. And a good early sign for Texas A&M. They covered well on the back end in coverage, but they were able to get pressure, which is really their trademark. 40 sacks, first in the SEC, fourth in all of college football at the FBS level this season. And this one's blocked. A&M gets there to take it off the leg of Maggio. And the Aggies are in the end zone. Charles Oliver plucked it for Texas A&M. Deshaun Capers Smith got in there to bust it up. Oh, the ruling on the field. Has the the ball was up. That's what anyone's down was recovered Jason, in the end zone. One of the things touchdown. that you see early in the bowl season or early in the game during the bowl season is special teams typically figure prominently into how this game starts. And you see A&M putting on the punt block early and coming up with a huge one. Those are the things that the layoff really gets to first. These young men hasn't ha haven't had the practice time that they do during the season, and sometimes special teams aren't really buttoned up. And if you have a team that's maybe thinking about going south with a new head coach, this will rev them up and turn that table very quickly in a bowl game. AM the block and the opening lead. Beautiful day in Charlotte, North Carolina. The bands have been struck up. There's some barbershop quartet action maybe going on. I don't know. It was a uh, it was quite the festive day here at the Belt Bowl, a game that you've done before. Wake Forest has been here previously, but Texas A&M and Charles Oliver off the punt block have the early lead. 
Oliver, the beneficiary of the block from Deshaun Capers Smith. And Texas A&M holds a 7 nothing lead. And this is a team that, I, look, we heard so many players during the course of the week say, we want to win this for Kevin Sumlin. He was well-liked by these players. Yeah. Christian Kirk being one of those guys who said that. And by the way, as we mentioned, the new head coach, who these players will get to know, Jimbo Fisher, will join us later on in the first quarter. And there is the interim head coach. It's Jeff Banks, a former punter. We asked him, <laughs> hey, how many former punters are head coaches? He said, uh, there are more interims than regular <laughs> head coaches who are punters. Fairly safe bet, no doubt about it. But I talked to him on the field before the game, Jeff Banks, and he said that it was an emotional evening when he they met for, with the players as a, as a total group for the, for the last time. And because over the course of five, six years, you form relationship with these guys that really in many cases go on for a lifetime. And so saying goodbye, you know, the last one of everything you're going to do with these kids is an emotional time. And he said it was again the same this morning, but he said he thought his guys were in the right frame of mind. Once they focused on the game plan and they could focus on football and and forget the minutia outside of the game, he said they really have had a great couple of weeks of preparation. You say uh, memories for a lifetime. Noel Mazzoni, his offensive coordinator for this game, was was your coach in yeah. college. Yeah, and we, I went down on the field before the game, and I did with Coach Mazzoni what he did with me all of the years that I was with him. We walked the field and found the play clocks. That's exactly what he did with me before every game, and I said, make sure you know where the play clocks are. Clocks are. You got to laugh out of that. Big special teams turn. Goes the other way now for Texas A&M. Braden Mann kicks it out of bounds. In case you're wondering what Wake Forest did this year, 7-5, and 4-4 four and four in the ACC. And we mentioned John Wolford and his grand success this season at the quarterback position. Four and four points, he's part of the reason for it. They beat NC State, very good team, 30 to 24. But then at the end of the regular season, they lose to Duke and they actually had to call the players back onto the field who wanted to get off the field so quickly after that loss to be on the field along with the band and the alma mater. So Wake Forest would like to have that last one back, but an offense that will score some points on you. And this is driven back to Bari Hines is absolutely lit up by Debian Renfro, the freshman corner. And Jason, I think we saw the turning point of this Wake Forest offense in particular, and John Wolford specifically in the bowl game last year, where they made a commitment to go fast and go with this RPO system, and they have the right quarterback to do that. Third down coming up, and Dave Quasson was interesting when he said yesterday that they felt like this is the first time that the offense was ahead of the defense in his tenure. And look at that turnaround. I mean, that's amazing. That's, you know, through the bowl game last year and then through the regular season coming into this game this year, I've never seen a turnaround in any unit in football quite like you've seen out of Wake Forest offensively. Offense or defense, you're saying. Period. Wolford. There's a hold coming, so this play is dead, and it is nearly intercepted. Justin Huron is going to get called for the hold, so this play is going to come back. Holding, holding offense number 75. Penalties declined. Result of the play, fourth down. And actually, you can hear that it was an incomplete pass, so obviously going to be declined. But the thing that's happening early is A&M is actually absolutely locking down on the receivers for Wake Forest. And that was a matchup we had to see. Better production out of Wake Forest receivers, but this is an SEC group in the secondary. This punch blocked as well. Maggio has this one smacked away. Unreal. Donovan Wilson this time for the Aggies. Maggio had one blocked in 12 games in the regular season. How about this? Hey, Jason, if your interim head coach is going to be a former punter, why not have special teams turn the tide early? The Belt Bowl, brought to you by Bell, the home of modern Southern style.
Visit Belp.com today. The Capital One Venture Card. Earn unlimited double miles on every purchase every day. What's in your wallet? And AT&T. All right, so here's a reason to really want to play in the Belk Bowl. Other than a great trip to Charlotte and playing in an NFL stadium, you get a $450 gift card to the Belk store in the South Park Mall. So all the players went shopping. They did close the jewelry portion of the store just in case as this goes to the sideline and a first down for Osborn. So A&M had nine yards in its first possession, but the punt block got, got him a touchdown. And now they're moving into Wake territory. Starkle rolls the pocket, throws it deep. Kirk is there. Christian Kirk is down inside the two-yard line against East St. Bessie. And Jason, you talked about Starkle was rolling the pocket left, and Kirk was running a post with the middle of the field open coming from the right, and Starkle found him. Williams, the running back, skates him for the touchdown. Offense looks so easy when you incorporate a splash play on the big post route to Kirk from Starkle and then a zone read down on the goal line and AM's making it look awfully easy early in this one. Special teams and offensive look. Two block punts, a 31 second touchdown drive, and a lead of two scores at 14 for the Aggies. Wake Forest has a reputation of getting after the passer as well. They had a boatload of tackles for loss, and Kirk is going to be the backside receiver because your quarterback, Starkle, is going to go to the left. You have a post. The middle of the field clears out because that safety goes with the quarterback's maneuver to the left, and you can see that Christian Kirk makes a great catch at the end. And you have to not only run the route, which Kirk does with his speed, but you have to finish the play, and Christian Kirk does that very well also. Here's a guy in Christian Kirk who A&M's folks told us came in essentially a pro-ready guy, not only in terms of body, but in terms of mentality. Yeah. And it was almost fate that Noel Mazzoni ended up coaching him. He wanted him at UCLA and tried to get him to go to UCLA. Kirk decided on A&M, and then Mazzoni gets hired at A&M. He gets to coach the kid. <laughs> yeah, I don't know who recruited who in that situation, but Mazzoni said he had to take the A&M job just so he could coach number three. Well, he originally wanted D.J. Foster, who went to the same high school as Kirk, and he ended up with Christian Kirk falling in his lap. Wade on the return for Wake, whose special teams need a positive. And they're across the 30-yard line. Capital One Bowl Mania later on. One more game. We can call this a basketball school matchup now. Kentucky and Northwestern off their first trip to the NCAA tournament last year. The Wildcats, it's the Franklin American Mortgage Music City Bowl. Last time these teams met, it was 1928. Kelly Stauffer was just five years old. And Northwestern won seven to nothing. Happy fifth birthday. <laughs> A lot of games coming up today that Kentucky Northwestern battle Cotton Bowl Classic coming up as well as Wolford is on target for Scotty Washington and a Wake Forest first down but USC Ohio yeah. State later on that has everything great defense against great offense future NFL quarterback at least one of them. Yeah and the Rose Bowl gone Cotton Bowl. It's a great matchup between the Pac-12 and the Big Ten and two great quarterbacks. Darnold coming out. No one knows that. That's going to be a terrific game to watch. Wolford, another bullseye across the 45 to Barry Hines. Not only Darnold, but Ronald Jones the second, yeah. who you saw on our airwaves essentially grow up. He was in the Under Armour All-American game just a couple of years ago, made his commitment to USC and one of the star running backs of the country as well. 
as A&M's rush defense stacks up Colburn third down. Yeah, and in the meantime, Wake Forest right here needs a first down because they want to go fast, but you can only go fast if you're efficiently moving the football, and Wake's yet to do that. Could be two down territory. Wolford has the first down. Scotty Washington, who had only 10 catches last year, he's parlayed that into nearly 40 this season. And when Wake is moving it, they literally want to snap the ball 9 to 11 seconds after the ball is spotted, but you have to be efficient in order to get that done. Flag comes in behind the play. Clemens, the tackle of Colburn, and we'll check the marker from our Pac-12 crew. Personal foul, tripping. Offense number 73. 15 yards from the previous spot. Remains first down. Wake top 25 in the country fewest penalty yards but a couple costly ones against the offensive line. Yeah and we talked about it they want to go fast and in order to do that you obviously have to be in rhythm and, and be moving the ball efficiently but you also can't go fast if you're overcoming penalties and that's what we've seen out of Wake thus far kind of a, a rusty start early in this one out of Wake Forest offensively and special teams by the way. Yeah, they don't want to get into a punt situation again. No, they do again. not want the punt team to show themselves again. Washington again back to midfield. This offensive line for Wake has gotten so much better this year, allowing just 17 sacks as compared to the scramble fest that Wolford had the last three years. Dave Clawson said, look, John Wolford had to have led the country in number of plays finished by a defensive line on game tape last year. Washington is open. Scotty Washington to the end zone. He beat Renfro for the score 50 yards away. And that's where you see the intelligence of John Walford in that experience. He comes to the line of scrimmage. You saw him back off a little bit. He diagnosed pressure coming from his left, a one-on-one -on -one matchup between his speedy receiver and Scotty Washington and the true freshman corner in Rimfro, and it was no match outside. Washington beat Rimfro right off the line of scrimmage, and then it was a foot race that Rimfro is not going to win when it has to do with Scotty Washington. Senior kicker Mike Weaver for Wake Forest knocks it through. You want points? Yeah. You want points on your Friday? We got them. It's a great throw, but the work really was done, first of all, out of Wolford at the line of scrimmage. He backed off. He diagnosed pressure, took a little more time, diagnosed the one-on-one -on -one bump and run matchup, a true freshman in Rimfo Fro and Scotty Washington that is that speed explosive guy that has emerged in this Wake Forest offense. They needed a guy to stretch the field and Washington has been that guy this year. Wake Forest in passing efficiency last year was 120th. They're 13th this year and the Jacksonville kid. Wake Forest has a wonderful pedigree of Jacksonville quarterbacks. Riley Skinner was from the Bulls school. Wolford from Jacksonville as well and Bishop Kenny he was five for five on the drive, and now he's in Riley Skinner territory. They need to go to Jacksonville more for their quarterbacks. Say, you know, one coach has Jacksonville, and you just go in there and kind of mine some quarterbacks out of there, right? It sounds pretty easy to me. One of the top cities in Northeast Florida. <laughs> no one else has that in mind, I assume. Oh, look, another kick out of bounds. Early special teams for Wake have been a debacle unreal all right so it's like 15 minutes from door to door bowl school to bishop kenny on route 13 in jacksonville and wake forest has two of its biggest name quarterbacks from there yeah so where's the next big quarterback in that vicinity i mean do we know that yet you are asking me Get to go Logan recruit Bill on the phone and let's see what this recruiting <laughs> he's out in a showing. rainstorm somewhere i think isn't that what he normally does during bowl season? Wake Forest under Riley Skinner was in this bowl 10 years ago. They beat Connecticut. Kenny Moore was the MVP. So good memories of this stadium in Charlotte. 
Starkle back to the controls. This one is behind Ford, and he's swallowed by Duke Ejiofor. Ejiofor has been that pressure guy his entire career. He comes off the edge, and in this case, he catches Ford on that quick swing pass, but it's the tackles for loss that Wake Forest lives on. It's their, it's their sweet spot defensively, and they always make the offense come uphill. After an eight-yard loss, this one's not going much of anywhere either for Ford. So Duke Ejiofor with that first tackle. Here's a young man whose name is actually, his family name is Ejiofor, but he wants to be an edge rusher. So he said, <laughs> call me Ejiofor. It's kind of like Superman and Clark Kent. You're Clark Kent by day and Superman by night. So you're Ejiofor on one hand and Ejiofor on the other. I guess that works. You think he's got a cape or something? I'm not sure. Third down and 18. Starkle, deep ball, sideline, little comeback. Christian Kirk did bring it in. There's a flag down, though, at the 20 and the 22 each. Looks as though this play will come back. There are two fouls on the offense, both on number 75. Holding, that penalty's declined. Personal foul, hands to the face. Number 75, half the distance to the goal, remains third down. It's on the left tackle, Coda Martin. And Coda Martin is actually getting up high on edge of four. That edge rusher is that kind of the epicenter of the pressure out of Wake Forest. And he's a constant pressure guy and has been that really all of his career in sacks, tackles for loss. He's disruptive and he's doing it on this drive right here. White flag here for Texas A&M on this drive on the high tackle of Ford. No flag comes flying in, however. Justin Sternod was in on the play, and it's fourth down. That penalty negated a 22-yard pass play. Yeah, and it was a nice pass play from Starkle to Christian Kirk on the overplay of the corner on the bump-and-run coverage in a back shoulder throw, but in the end, it was all for naught. Kelly, 21 plays in this game, 21 points so far. We going to have a fun afternoon or what? We are. Remember that empty the empty the bucket deal, right? Oh, yeah, there's some plays still left in the old quiver for Noel Mazzoni. Uh, Noel Mazzoni. So it's a 37-yard punt, no return. Jimbo Fisher is here at the stadium, and he will join us in the booth. Coming up, the new A&M head coach. Welcome back to Charlotte. 14 to 7 is your score. Beautiful day for the Belk Bowl and a beautiful day to introduce you all to the new head coach at Texas A&M. You may have seen him in other colors. Jimbo <laughs> Fisher joins us. Thanks for the time, coach. Glad to be with y'all. All right, so why Texas A&M? Well, I mean, uh, Scott Woodward, our AD, uh, and I had a previous relationship, a very good relationship, and uh, you know, he called and, and presented the opportunity and then you know, presented a lot of things that go with it and, and their commitment to excellence from the chancellor to the president through him and what they're trying to do. And, and then you got a huge recruiting base in Texas, and I think there's so much untapped potential at Texas A&M and a chance to be one of the elite programs in all of America, and it was just something that I thought was the right move at the right time. What's the hardest part of the transition? Uh, I, I think just trying to make sure you get your feet on the ground. With the new signing period, it really has jumped up. You know what I mean? The new yeah. signing period has changed things so quickly because that, that has really changed it over because you're, you had a signing day, not just to get out and visit and, and see kids, but the signing and the recruiting to me has been the hardest transition. Wolford, the completion there for Tabari Hines. We're joined by Jimbo Fisher. The new head coach at Texas A&M. What do you think of your guys so far today? Well, hey, great, two great special teams plays. I mean, got the punt, and then Christian Kirk, of course, makes big plays. Stark will hit him on a big play, and then, but you know, I played against Wake. Dave Clawson does a tremendous job, and they're not going. They, they do a great job on offense, and now they're getting to that empty set. Now, watch the quarterback runs could come right here in a heartbeat. This guy's really dynamic with the ball. Incomplete from Wolford that time. You may not have the chance to coach Christian Kirk, though. Nah, I, I doubt if we will, but, you know, we'll have to wait and see. But he's an outstanding. And the times I've met with him, what an outstanding young man. Why so? 
I mean, just because one is player, but when he you watch him practice, you watch him around his teammates, the leader he is, his personality is, and the way he interacts with you know when he first met me, the, the professionalism, and, and this guy has all his ducks in a row. He knows what he wants in his life. What do you think of the early signing period? You know, I'm not a big fan of it in December. I think it should be at the end of the summer because, I mean, you've got some fun for coaches who are coming back, like myself, who have two or three weeks to get a signing class together. That's tough. We had we, we were playing the state championship games in Texas, and that's signing week. So you got kids trying to play for a state championship. you got final exams. I mean, and you've you got coaches playing for major bowl games mm -hmm. that are being played right in the middle of signing day. I mean, I think it has to go at the beginning, and it's too close to, the, to February, in my opinion. Weaver on for the field goal. This will be from about 48 for the senior kicker. His long this year is 43. Maggio will hold. Weaver. No good. A flag has come in, however, on the play. Roughing the kicker, defense. Roughing the penalty. kicker. Automatic first down. Mm. You're shaking your head. Huh. That's a tough one there. You got out with points and would have great field position. Now you're putting them right down in point range. I mean, but, you know, we, we block so many kicks, you know. They do it great. That's, just, that's the chances you take. All right, so let me ask. When you're evaluating a coaching staff, when you're joining a new school, how do you go about doing that? Well, I mean, you, you're, you're just evaluating their organization, their procedures, you know, how the effect they have on the players and their, and their techniques and, and what they're teaching. I mean, and, and like I say, at the same time, you're standing back and, and really you are truly observing because you don't know the whole year of all the preparation that's went into things. you got to be very careful to make rash judgments very quickly. And you made the decision not – to do really any hands-on stuff in terms of the bowl, bowl prep, right? Exactly right. It's not fair to those kids. Those kids have been with these coaches, this group of guys, the, the terminologies, all the things they have, and there's no reason for me to try to put my input on this program right now. We'll do it after the bowl game, and I think it's only fair to the kids and the coaches are there to let them finish the year out. Do you schedule meetings with the players, the players that you will have, just so you can introduce yourself? No, I do. I had a team meeting, and an individual, they would come by and say hello and, and meet a lot, as many of the guys as I possibly could. Between For the first two weeks, I wasn't there. <laughs> I was on the road recruiting, but then we tried to do it in the meantime. That early signing day thing again. Yes, exactly. So Weaver off the field. Colburn in motion on first down for Wake Forest. Walford is dragged down, just hogtied by Peavy, but a flag is in, so that may have been an illegal tackle. Oh, face mask Personal coming. Personal foul, face mask. Defense number 93. Yeah. Half the distance to the goal. Automatic first down. All right, bowl games so many weeks off. How do you make sure this kind of stuff doesn't happen? You, it, that's the hardest thing. It, it, the, you know, the time off of getting game prep, and you got to make practice as live as you can without getting the injuries and, and try to put them in game situations where they're playing fast and making sure you get good on good because the worst thing you can do is only go against your scout team the whole time because you don't get that fastball up. Yeah. But then you, then you risk injuries, but you got to do it. Wolford over the middle, and this is brought in to Barry Hines for Wake Forest on the touchdown. Jason, this is where I think John Wolford has improved the most, is the quick decision and then the decisive throw. I think all of that is tied to much more confident feet that you see on tape, but once he pulls the trigger here, he doesn't hold back. It's a tight window to Hines. He gets slammed to the ground. He knows he's going to get hit. It's just a slant inside, beat the coverage, cross the face of the defender, and the quarterback has a really tiny window, and Wolford has grown leaps and bounds in that department. Jimbo, you've seen him oh, over the years. He, what he, Ace Kelly's talking about, his growth over the years when he was a freshman and starting when he was a sophomore in these last two years, you see a big difference in him. And it's, I mean, like you say, being able to hold that football right to the very end before he lets it go and let things develop and, and not bail out. And, and this is a kid that took a beating oh. for three years. I mean, part of it was your guys beating him. <laughs> we did it a couple State. times. And so to be able to stand in there your last season and 
take hits but have the production that he's had sometimes as a quarterback and you know this you know that to get to the end of the rainbow you're going to have to take one under the chin exactly. like Wolford does right here but he has Hines stays in the pocket gets slammed but he gets up and knows that he threw a touchdown pass and what people don't realize what that does to your defense yeah when they see that quarterback standing there and take that shot That's and they know that guy, will, that guy will, that guy will go to the mat for you when that quarterback's on your team is tough and competitive your whole team becomes that way because they know if they can get the ball back to that guy he he will do whatever he has to do for us to win, and that's what he's doing for them. So you've seen now very close up two of the great recruiting places in this country, yeah. Florida, Texas. What's the difference between the two and how you recruit them? I don't know if there is, I think, because it's all about relationships. It's all about, in recruiting, you can say all you want, you have players everywhere, but you could have relationships. You could have relationships with your high school coaches because those are your lifeline, those are the players. And you've got to spend time. You've got to go out and make them, make yourself available to them, let them know what your message is, what the culture you want to create is, and understand how important they are to you in this success. And, and just build those relationships with the coaches and the players in your state. So. When we watch Texas A&M next year, what's going to be the biggest difference we see? I mean, schematically, offensively, you do something different mm -hmm. than what Noel Mazzoni does. Yep. But what are we going to see that we say, man, that's a lot different than what I saw a year ago? Well, I don't know about that. Where'd you go? But, I mean, you'll probably see more tight ends. I yeah. mean, you got we got to play with some three-man services. I think in the SEC, those three-man services are huge, especially with the defensive linemen you face. Because in the South, the, the, the number of defensive linemen and those edge guys are very mm – -hmm. got to chip them. you got to take care of them. you got to help take care of your inside guys. Hopefully we can be more physical in the run. But, I mean, they still got dynamic receivers, and hopefully we can keep throwing the football. Starkle does a great job with that, him and Mond and, and those guys have. And defensively, we want to be aggressive, and we want to stay the same specialty. We want to try and block kicks. We, we blocked six this year at Florida State. Yeah. And we want to do the same thing here and have great returners, and we've been able to do that. What do you think in terms of your evaluation of Nick Starkle? What have you seen so far? I like a big guy can make throws, processes information well, can reach all parts of the field with his throws, and uh, I think has a really bright future. Starkle okay, over the job. middle, and it's Osborne into space for a first down. How much time have you gotten to spend with each of these guys, and Starkle specifically? Uh, we've I've, we had some individual conversations at times, but I've tried again stay away from him just to get to know him and, and watch him, and and I just have fun observing him. And he, his great work ethic. I think he's a, he's a he's a football junkie as far as I think a film junkie makes likes the film room, likes the whys of the game. And I think when a quarterback understands the whys of the game, he has a chance. So once this game ends. How long before you get to spend some quality time with Starkle and the other quarterback? It'll be about a week and a half because I'm going to let him come home and get a break. And our school doesn't start to the 16th. So we'll get, a, we'll get a big break there. They'll be back that week of the 12th. And so it'll be about a week, week and a half. What's something you learned about Texas A&M in the process of getting hired here or taking the job or having had the job that you didn't know? The genuineness of the people. I mean, it, it's a They have so many traditions, which I'm trying to learn them all. <laughs> I'm still learning, but, but they live them. The people and the culture at Texas A&M. It's very important for them of who they are and the, and the way they represent themselves. And I think everybody I've met, whether academic, from, from administration to players, they all take great pride in who they are as people and what they represent in Texas A&M University. I mean, we got great facilities. You got all those types of things, but there's great people there. That's what I see. Christian Kirk slips well, a tackle and finds his way to the marker. Can you convince? It, maybe <laughs> it would be nice. Around. It would be nice. But I, <laughs> I know it, it, he's got his future set out. And if, you know, if he's, he's going to go as high as they say, yes, he should go. We talked to you about that a couple of months ago, actually, yes. when you were at Florida State, about trying to cultivate that future for your players. Exactly right. And, you, and the key to the whole thing is make sure they get the proper information. Because you have so many different people telling them things that they because of what they want. And kids at times hear what they want to hear. I mean, when you're that age, you hear what you no want to hear and don't want to hear the truth. But if you have the right information, and that's why I say about him, when meeting him, his head is really screwed on. I think he's a tremendous guy. and He's going to listen to the right people make the right decisions. Start going to the sideline. Nice the question that is, is did the foot get in? Wow. And it did for Damian Ratley. Can reach all parts of the field. Yeah, Ratley is a big play guy. He, you're not going to have him. He's a senior. But... That was his 12th catch of 20 plus yards and about 72% oh. of his, he doesn't get it down. They're going to wave it off now after deliberation. They're going to say incomplete. Wow. I don't know what part was the foot not coming down in bounds or not having possession of the ball, but over 70% of Ratley's catches are for first down. So he's the big play guy. Remember it's foot down with possession. Yeah, that right never touched. And then the left. Mm. 
Might have clipped the sideline. Wow. And Henderson, yep. Amari Henderson breaking on the ball, the corner for Wake, did a nice job of getting into the backside of Ratley, the receiver. Mm. That's interesting. That's Take close. a closer look at that. I You'd think they might have Time, use your timeout, coach. Am I right there now? Because it looked like part of his shoe did get that. That's hard now. That, that's that's you're splitting hairs. All right. So how hard is it to decide when to <laughs> maybe call that timeout and force the challenge and all that well, stuff? Well, it is because sometimes the people in your in your booth don't get the replay. Really? They're not there to be able to see the replay. If they can see the replay, it is. But otherwise, you're just going off the same eyes that we go from here. It's a hard deal. So some people say, why didn't you do it? It's a lot of that time comes the people in the box did not. We're not able to see a replay to get that communication down to you. And I tell you, timeouts are valuable. Well, you don't want to waste them when you don't have to. Hey, Coach, I do have one beef to pick with you. All right. Yesterday uh -oh. we saw you having lunch with your son. Uh huh. And there are rumors that AM paid you to go take this new job, and you were making him buy lunch. <laughs> what is up with that? Hey, as much Christmas as they got, he owes me big time. <laughs> They're spoiled rotten, I promise you. I, I spoiled them rotten at Christmas. Uh, there's no doubt. So uh, make, make him have to pay. What do you think? Catch or no catch? From that view, it looks the other view, the one view, the second view is right here is the one. It looks like the Receiver's back foot when the toe hit, hit the out of bounds line. The ruling's confirmed incomplete. Oh, okay. So that's that's the go. view. It was close. It was close. It, it, I can see that going either so this way. This is about where you start arguing with the official just a little bit to send a message well, for the next exactly one. Exactly right? right. You got you got to you got to get your little jabs in. You got to let them know you can't. You're not going to listen to everything they no say. Doubt. What's the biggest stressor that people wouldn't expect on game day? The thing that stresses you out that people might not expect. Huh. I don't. You know, game days aren't really stressors to me. I think it's the days leading up. The really? game days themselves, I think, you know, you if you put the work in, you feel good about yeah. what you're doing. I mean, to people, that's when I think I relax the most. You know, it's doing the week and making sure that you went back and you go through your checklist. I yeah. went over that. They understand this. They understand that. The day of the game, because once you get all those things checked off, you know you have good players. You've prepared them well. You, you let it go. The days before, to me, the day before is really the stressor. When you do your final walkthroughs, have I hit that enough? Do they understand the third down tendencies? Do they understand the red zone yeah. tendencies? Whatever it may be. See, I, uh, Jason, I agree with Coach as, as a coach and a player. The haze in the barn by game day. Exactly. That's really the reward of all the preparation you've done. So I completely agree with what Jimbo just told us. Well, just being in the booth with you, Kelly, stresses me out. So I guess I have a different <laughs> yeah. feel for yeah, it. That's a different feel altogether. Good job sliding in the pocket. Flag, though. Yeah, go. You're still coaching this game. <laughs> you don't even have a headset on. <laughs> that goes to the <laughs> sideline. Oh, still coaching. Yeah, go. Ten yard penalty. Replay third mm. down. You were talking about Nick Starkle sliding in the pocket here. Yeah, well, I mean, pocket president Kelly tell you that. You, just because guys aren't runners doesn't mean they can't. They're not elusive. You feel pressure. You never, you know, you read coverage. You feel pressure, and his eyes are staying up, and he's doing a great job of shuffling his feet. And when the ball had to be delivered, he could get it planted and go. And he does. He has a good feel. And just because a guy isn't a runner doesn't mean he can't be elusive. Yeah, I played with Dan Marino for one year in oh. Miami, and that guy couldn't run across the street. But he got every throw <laughs> no, off that exactly. you want to get off. He was the best in the business. And speed that. those hands up and slow them down. Yep. Starkle. Oh. And miscommunication. Yep. Like he's going back shoulder. Who's that normally on? What's that? Well, that you, type of thing. Well, I mean, the, the receiver's got to run the route full speed. The worst thing to do to me when you're running the back shoulder fade is try to look for the back shoulder. You've got to run and make the defender run and because that defines it for the quarterback. When yeah. it gets tough on the quarterback to me is when those guys are looking back shoulder, well, then everybody's squatting on the play. And, and you've got to feel that. And then you, as it is, you've got to feel if he's going by him or if he's on that, you know, if, he, if the guy's got his hips and got on his front shoulder. And I just reps and reps and reps and knowing your personnel. Jimbo's just coaching it up. <laughs> I mean, seriously, that is good stuff. Tripuka to punt, and Wake Forest will get it back. Bates with the fair catch. Jimbo Fisher, thank you so much hey, for joining pleasure us. Pleasure to be with you guys. Thank you. Y'all have a yeah, Merry, nothing but Merry Christmas and a Happy forward. New Year. All right, you too. Thank Congratulations. You. Thank Buy you. your son's dinner tonight. <laughs> I might tonight. <laughs> thank you, Coach, for your time. Appreciate it. Jimbo Fisher joining us here at the Belk Bowl in Charlotte, and we remind you that you can watch the ESPN app at any moment, as long as your phone or tablet is charged, right? Charge your phone, watch the app. Games galore today. I think that's where Jimbo's going right now. I think he's going to jump on the app. How about that? Yeah. You can download it right now, immediately. I think he's got it already, but uh, great insight from Jimbo Fisher. And you're right, his son, when Coach, we walked up, had a wad of bills out to pay the tip it's funny. for lunch. Coburn on the run, into space. Down the sideline, Colburn. And 
Yachty kept his feet all the way down into the red zone. My goodness. And about 10 seconds later, the next snap is going to happen. But Colburn has also been that cog in this Wake Forest offense that really has stepped up. His elusiveness and bringing that explosion to this game, offensive game for Wake Forest. Colburn inside the 10. You may know him as Jay Byrne, though, because that is his stage name. He's a singer as well. Really? Hopes to have a music career. Well, he stole that name from you. That's what I call you, Jay Byrne. Yeah, it's a little darker than that. Second down for the Demon Deacons. Walford dropped. Chuck Wade had a touchdown in his mitts. And once again, we saw Wolfer do this to Hines, sticking that ball in on the touchdown pass earlier, and this should have been the same thing to Wade. Play action, it's really a, an RPO, a run pass option, and the quarterback, Wolfer pulls it, throws it to Wade, and Wade should have come down with a touchdown in the end zone. Third down, Wolford. Quick throw, incomplete, too much for Wade. He was wide open. And Wade was pressing the defender and then going kind of to a fade into the corner and got tied up a little bit with the Texas A&M defender out wide. And that's why that ball was overthrown. It was actually thrown to the right spot. The receiver, Wade, was late getting there. Question that we were asking ourselves is, Weaver healthy enough after the roughing the kicker penalty to boot this. He's going to out of the hold from Maggio. 28 yard field goal for the first Wake Forest lead this afternoon. And there it is. We're on pace for 120 plus points today. And here's why. And Jay Byrne has been doing this all year. He's stayed healthy enough to get the touches, and he brings an explosiveness to that run game that they hadn't had before. And then on the RPO, Wolford pulls it, throws a strike, and there was a little distraction by the receiver, and Wade drops that one. And then Wade gets tied up in coverage a little bit and doesn't get off cleanly and get to this one. That's pretty well thrown, probably a little bit too long, but if Wade was a little bit quicker getting there, that last pass also had an opportunity. So Wake Forest goes down big off punt blocks and all kinds of special team shenanigans, and now suddenly three straight scoring drives for the Demon Deacons after the first two possessions had no first downs in tow. After an out-of-bounds kickoff, you go ahead and chip it in the air, and Texas a and is going to take it all the way to the 40-yard line. Colin Gillespie, the linebacker, with maybe his favorite play of the season. There's your drive chart. Ugly and then not so ugly. That's called knocking the bull break rust off, I think. Went nowhere on the first two drives, and it looked... On those last three drives, similar to the way this offense for Wake Forest has looked really all year. Completely different than a year ago. And we talked about that, Jason, when we started this game. I haven't seen that big of a turnaround in one unit in football and professionally or in college in all of my years of doing this. And it starts with the quarterback and John Wolford in a completely different place than he was a year ago. So Dave Clawson, in his fourth season at Wake Forest, the fourth season has been the season for him. Everywhere he's gone, he's had success. He is 36 and 16 in his fourth year as a head coach, whether it be Wake Forest or Bowling Green or Fordham. He's 20 and 29 overall at Wake, but that fourth season has been dynamic. Yeah, and there is a theme to that. It's getting the roster set, getting your guys in place, and then they start to play well within the system. Starko back shoulder throw for Osmond incomplete. Cameron Glenn shuttled him to the sideline third down. But well thrown by Starkle once again. Osmond comes down out of bounds. Not really being aware of where he is on the sideline. If he can get that left foot down in bounds, and that's what you have to do. Only one foot 
is needed in college and Osmond doesn't do it there but well thrown by Starkle once again. I think Jimbo Fisher is going to have fun with Starkle next year. You know you get that feeling don't you. Yeah. A lot of games coming up later on tonight including the Cotton Bowl as Starkle had his arm hit or he just released the ball too early or something looked bad. Sternod with the pressure and it's fourth down. Yes, yeah, Sternod was added to the rush that time and he got by the offensive lineman and he was on the throwing arm of Starkle and hit his hand, I believe. I believe Sternod actually got to this, actually hit his elbow, I think, right at the very end. And good pressure once again, and that's who Wake is. Tripuco with the punt. Jesse Bates waves for the fair catch. Allstate is proud to be part of the team that comes together to do good by contributing to participating universities' general scholarship funds for each field goal and extra point kick to date. Allstate has contributed millions in scholarship funds. I'm going to miss the Allstate Nets during the football offseason. Really? Aren't you? I don't yes, know that I'll miss I the am. Nets. I'll, I'll miss you talking about the Nets oh. and doing that read incessantly every time we have a game. But that, that, boy, that was heartwarming at first. Wake Forest back to the offense and Colburn pinballing off the tacklers to the 21. We talked about the influence of Matt Colburn in this offense, and Cade Carney has been banged up, and he was really the battering ram in this offense a year ago. Old school downhill, and Colburn brings more elusiveness to this Wake Forest run game. Wolford over the middle has another first down. This again to Tabari Hines, and you have to imagine Cade Carney would have loved to play in this game yeah. for Wake Forest. He grew up a huge Wake fan. He was a big Chris Barclay fan but it's going to be Colburn today as the first quarter comes to an end in Charlotte. Welcome back to the Belk Bowl and a truly fantastic thing that Belk is doing. This Belk organization decided not only are they going to team up with Habitat for Humanity to give a house, but they're donating a home and some of the fixings for the home as well for Josiah Parker and his mother, Michelle. Josiah was diagnosed with kidney cancer at age six and uh, is doing very well. His mother, Michelle, works actually for Habitat for Humanity. She's a couple of doors down from the house, and uh, they provide a defense. They provided another of different uh, amenities as well for the house, and a wonderful thing that Belk did. Colburn on the catch and out of bounds just short of the 40-yard line. Antonio Howard with the tackle so third down coming up for Wake Forest an offense that is really turning along over the middle this is our first look at Cam Serene the tight end who likely is going to be playing on Sundays for a while yeah he's the prototypical I think NFL tight end he can flex he can run routes out of the slot he can be the end of the man line of scrimmage blocker and he's a mismatch especially in nickel packages for defenses. This is a beautiful jumping grab by Scotty Washington. Oh my. And a tremendous throw by John Wolford. But at the end Scotty Washington goes up and makes a tremendous play on the football. Doesn't get much better than that at the end of that Texas one. Texas A&M. And a timeout, Texas A&M. Jeff Banks, the interim head coach, told us one of the things I'm going to have to do to get myself in the head coach mode is to ask the coordinators when we need a timeout. 
Yeah, and watch the end of this again. Scotty Washington, he really emerged in a game we had last year, Wake against Louisville on the road, and and Scotty Washington showed up big there, has really stepped out of the shadows ever since then, and he's had a great year, almost 16 yards a, a pop, and when you can finish on the football like that, good things are are in store for you. Richard, sophomore, so he has more football yet to left to play but you could see what wake is doing once they got into this rhythm they go fast their quarterback makes really quick decisions and typically good decisions and they have big plays they have four plus 20 plays as we speak that's who wake forest is offensively Incomplete, Serenay the intended target, and second down. And Serenay, as you talked about, Jason, was banged up most of last year. And even when he played, he wasn't healthy enough to really center the game plan around. But John Wolford is very comfortable with him and tried to get him in the end zone on that last play. Serenay on the throwback, kept his feet, and beautifully so. He's a couple yards short of the first down marker. We talked about Scotty Washington and Tubari Hines has caught a touchdown pass already. And then the third piece of the puzzle was Serenay, that flex tight end that can be moved around, be a blocker in the box, but also be a mismatch running a route downfield. End zone. Beautiful diving grab by Tabari Hines for the Wake Forest touchdown. Well, we just saw all three of the receiving options that John Wolford has had a tremendous year throwing to. Hines on this touchdown, the explosive play Scotty Washington earlier, and then we saw Serenay targeted on this route, on this drive a couple of times. That's the pass game in a nutshell for Wake Forest in 2017. AM's fans are yelling for a replay. The field of touchdown is under review. And they're going to look at it. I don't think the replay booth actually listens you don't to think the fans, so. do they? You don't think so? No, I don't think so. They listen to you and I at times, but once again, a great throw. Inside receiver Hines going to the corner. It's about possession when you're in bounds the left elbow was down before anything else and if he had possession at that point then it's a good catch it's anything but the hand and the foot and that left elbow which is blocked on that particular shot seems to be the first thing that hits down in bounds I think you're right left elbow followed quickly by the right elbow and Tabari Hines seems to have made a Really nice touchdown catch. We had John Wolford in Wake Forest a couple of times yeah. last year. This is a different cat this year, is it not? It is. I mean, he's totally on target. And again, he's just not making any mistakes either. Oh. And the speed in which he makes his decisions in that run pass concept and Dave Clawson said in going into the bowl game last year, so during bowl practice, they made a commitment to the RPO system, run pass option. Your quarterback has to be a quick decision maker and make good decisions, and they thought they had the guy to do that, and he did not disappoint all of this season. I talked to John Wolford yesterday and he told me the last couple years he's been extremely skittish in the pocket. He said that happens when you're getting sacked an average of 43 times a game. Yeah, and Dave Clawson echoed After that review, yesterday. The ruling of touchdown stands. Stands not confirmed. But it's a touchdown nonetheless. There wasn't enough evidence to overturn, so the touchdown stands for Wake Forest. And Dave Clawson said, look, wouldn't you be on your yeah. heels? Well, you can teach all you want, but if there's that kind of duress. I've been that guy before. You get gun shy regardless of how tough you think you are at standing in the pocket. 
24-14. Wake Forest with the lead over Texas A&M. This is the Belk Bowl as part of Capital One Bowl Mania. And the ice skating in Uptown Charlotte, it's been cold enough to do so. And again, as we said, here at the Belk Bowl, there, a wonderful thing that the folks do is give kind of the run of uh, the store that we showed you earlier, the yeah. $450 gift card. And uh, we heard some great stories about people buying things of, of need for themselves with a shopping spree, certainly. And it's up to the coaches, as we talked about, to uh, make the decision to close off some parts of the store. That they don't need, right? That they don't need, <laughs> right. But we've heard stories of guys getting their first suits and buying things for their wives as Christian Kirk on the return is hit across the 20-yard line. Hey, the Goodyear Cotton Bowl Classic from AT&T Stadium in Arlington. Sam Darnold, number eight, USC. JT Barrett and number five, Ohio State. 8.30 Eastern, 5.30 Pacific on ESPN. And the ESPN app, you want to see future NFL players, you got them. Sam Darnold, number three in the top 40, according to Todd McShay. And he's going to face a defense that has some big names as well. Yeah, Ohio State, I heard Todd McShay say it this morning, has potentially eight guys that could get drafted if the young guys come out, the guys that are draft eligible. I mean, the talent in that game is just off the hook. Starkle down the middle and dropped. Ratley had his hands on it and couldn't turn it around as Amari Henderson was there to pry it free. And Ratley had the middle of the field open on a post route. We saw Christian Kirk catch one of these earlier, but the reason that ball is underthrown is because of the pressure in the face of Nick Starkle. He couldn't really step up and finish, and Calhoun was the one in the kitchen of the quarterback. That hole was filled quickly. Kendall Bussey and Luke Masterson up from the safety spot. Texas A&M trailing by 10. And one of the guys we're talking about as an NFL prospect is Christian Kirk. I, you hear so much about him in the liver smoothies and everything. He's got, a, got his own plan as well. But he said, look, we want to win this game for Kevin Sumlin. He has a great affinity for his former coach. away East Sang Bassey with the coverage on the sideline in front of Osmond. Chris. Jason Todd McShay is Christian Kirk ranked as the 22nd overall pick. Kirk told me yesterday he has not made a decision. He would wait until after the bowl game to weigh his options. But he did tell me that the coaching change would play a factor in his eventual decision. Well, Chris, Christian Kirk could make an NFL team just by special teams before you even analyze what he can do you know, as a receiver, he returns a punt for a touchdown almost every six times he touches it. And that is extremely valuable at that next level. Bates finally has one to return, and he does in a big way. Jesse Bates for Wake Forest. Touchdown! Well, the Wake Forest number three, Jesse Bates, wants to do his own thing with a punt return. We just got done talking about Christian Kirk's ability, and early in this game, it was Texas A&M coming up with the special teams plays, and, and now we see Wake Forest. So they got the rust off and gotten a rhythm offensively, and now the tide's starting to turn on the special teams as well with a really nice return with JC, Jesse Bates on that one. Extra point for Weaver and turnabout is fair play for the Wake Forest special teams. 31 unanswered points. Jesse Bates for the Demon Deacons trying to win their second straight bowl game. The Belk Bowl brought to you by Bell. The home of modern Southern style. Visit Belk.com today.
Ally, do it right. And Chevy. Chevy has earned J.D. Power Dependability Awards for cars, trucks, and SUVs. This is the Richard Petty driving experience. Players from both teams got to go about 160 miles an hour along the racetrack here in Charlotte. That looks like great fun. And some really big individuals had to get inside those cars or volunteer to. And it's not easy. Those cars aren't exactly made for 310, 15, 20 pounders. They said the largest person that was a football player they got into a car through the window is about 375. So, look, oh linemen can do it, too. <laughs> yeah, getting in's one thing. Getting out's a whole different story. Weaver on the kick, and Wake Forest has been a totally different team since the first couple of minutes of this game. Travion Williams just short of the 30-yard line. AM has the 42-yard hit to Christian Kirk, and then two yards of play after that. Yeah, and Noel Mazzoni, the offensive play caller, is going to have to get some of those, I think, tricks out of his bag. A lot of those gadget-type plays can be the infusion of energy that I think Texas A&M needs right now. Wake Forest woke up offensively and special teams now. Right now, I think what sits on the field is a question whether Texas A&M really wants to play this game. They have to prove it right here before the end of this half. You think maybe you pull one of those trick plays out? Absolutely. I think that's exactly what those plays are for. Over the middle, Osmond again. He's been a favorite target of Starkle today. And it's second down and short. You would like to work yourself into the middle of the field first before you pull one of those out. But I would not be surprised if we see one of those out of Noel Mazzoni sooner than later. Quick set, quick hit. Ratley on the run. Ratley nearly kept his feet. And he just did get back on top of the ball. They're going to call him down anyway. Kept the tackle. First down, Ratley. And Noel Mazzoni told us he thought this matchup in the pass game was in their favor because Wake Forest tends to play a little soft, and you've seen AM take advantage of that softness the last two plays. No gain for Ford on first down. So Texas A&M. With a win here today, would get that eighth victory again, and that's not the place the Aggies fans wanted to be, but eight and five has been the place that Texas A&M has visited each of the last three years after opening five and oh, five and oh, and six and oh. They'd need a comeback today to get there. Starkle to Kirk inside the 25. Hit by Kobe Davis, so the freshman safety is getting some run for Wake Forest today. And a &M's pass game is showing up because they're protecting better up front, and Starkle is dealing it down the field. Starkle on the screen for Buckley. Cameron Buckley roving inside the 15. And Jason, remember that seven out of the Nine receivers out wide for AM are freshmen and or redshirt freshmen. So these kids are still growing up, and Nomazoni knows that Jimbo Fisher has a lot of good players on the roster going forward. Ball came out. Kubota lost it, and Wake Forest creates a turnover. Jabari Williams. Wake Forest on the ground. That's the first down. Kubota, another one of those youngsters, a true freshman carrying the football, and that's the last thing to come with young players is ball security. And so many times it's not the guys you see, it's the impact that you don't expect. Question was, did the whistle come? But there was a clear recovery as well for Williams for Wake Forest. The turnover created, and they will go on the ground with Cade Carney, who does check in. And for Wake, that's only the sixth fumble recovery of the defense's season. Which is really unusual considering they have a school record 98 tackles for loss, and that pressure usually leads to those fumble recoveries and jarring the ball loose. Again, Carney picking his way. He thought maybe 
Wake would go for the jugular after the quick change, but in its own territory, a couple of runs on the first two downs. And a lot of those are decisions made by reading the defense. Run pass options or quarterback reads, typically, you don't know whether you're running or passing it until you read the defense. Wolford. Oh, what a leaping play by Cam Serene to come back for the ball. And there's a good example of a run pass option. It's a zone run inside. If the linebacker to that side where Serene is going to run the route two steps up and gives a window, you throw it to the tight end, and Serene secures the football on impact. Wolford. All the way to midfield. We were talking to Dave Clawson yesterday. He said Wolford is so smart on the point when he's got to choose between run and pass. He freezes the film while he's watching game film. He's so great yeah. at that split second decision. Instantaneous. And it's the it's the ball handling tied to the footwork. And Wolford is very, very good at that. Deep ball, out of contact. And a flag comes in. Charles Oliver, who had the touchdown of the punt block, got tangled with Hines. Pass interference, defense number 21. 15-yard penalty, automatic first down. Jason Tapari Hines was in the slot, and he was running a wheel route. Starts outside and then goes vertical, and then Oliver just gets all over him as the ball is in the air. The receiver looks back for the football and is able to find it, and Oliver never really did pick the football up and makes contact where the ball is in the air. That's the definition of pass interference. Not much there for Cade Carney, who grew up a huge Wake Forest fan. He's out of Advance, North Carolina, and Davidson Day. Came over from Davie County High School. He had Wake Forest posters in his room and getting to play for the Demon Deacons in this bowl game at the Belk Bowl this year. Cam Serene to the 25. And Wake has begun to use Serene, not unlike New England uses Gronk, a big body that you can have at the end of the line of scrimmage, or you can flex him out, and he's matched up on a linebacker where he runs routes on, or a nickelback where he has more size than, and both of those are matchups favorable to Wake Forest. Wolford on the roll, throws it incomplete, so fourth down and two. What are you doing here? Looks like kicking. Yeah, we see Weaver coming out. I don't know, as, as hot as John Wolford in that wake offense has been the last few drives, I'm not sure I wouldn't like him to have one more roll of the dice, but certainly this is what you would do in the regular season, why not do it here? 43 yards away this time for Weaver, who got roughed up earlier in the game. And it's blocked. The third blocked kick for AM. This is Justin Matabuke, the freshman, who got his hands on this one. This may be why you don't kick it. Keep your hot offense out there. AM is really good at blocking him. And that actually would have been equal to Weaver's long of the season. National Championship, Kendrick Lamar will be there. Star-studded event, certainly Texas A&M gets it back. Trailing by a couple of scores, Starkle to Ratley, who has been roaming through the Wake Forest secondary. He's up to the 46-yard line at a first down for AM. and m And A&M's pass game has been more patient the last couple of drives, trying to just get into the softness, those voids in the zone defense by Wake Forest, and Starkle just has to be efficient at doing that. 
Travion Williams, a sophomore who Kevin Sumlin was fond of saying last year that he should be at his high school prom rather than at <laughs> college football, just a sophomore for Texas A&M. 1,000 plus yards as a freshman and has had a really good year. Been banged up more this year. Certainly a home run hitter when he's healthy. Starkle, Kirk, there he goes, Christian Kirk, touchdown. Big plays have been a problem for the Wake secondary, that one 52. Nearest defender in the area was Luke Masterson, a red shirt sophomore safety who was out over the top of, of Kirk, actually, Right there at the top, it's a safety that Kirk gets up on to very quickly and runs a post, but Masterson was looking for help in the middle that never came, and they talked it over after the play, but there was certainly a coverage bust on that. Way too easy for Christian Kirk. Belt Bowl records may be assaulted today. Christian Kirk, a buck 14 of the year already for the interim coach, Jeff Banks. 31-21 midway in the second quarter. Take us through the touchdown, Kelly Stoffer. Well, it was more about the breakdown of coverage. I think Luke Masterson is one safety, and he was expecting help from the other safety, and it just never came. He was occupied by his own vertical route. Way too easy for Christian Kirk. And here's the evidence of that breakdown. Luke Masterson is over the top of Christian Kirk to safety right there, but he's expecting help from the other safety. But look at the other safety has a vertical route that he's occupied to by as well. So in the end, Luke Masterson is on his own against Christian Kirk, and trust me, that's not going to end well if you're Wake Forest. Christian Kirk, who's got a very coordinated workout regimen, right, Chris? Yeah, no matter if he goes to the pros this year or not, he's already a pro in the way that he treats his post-game regimen. He wakes up in the morning and has a liver smoothie twice a week, followed by... As Serene makes a catch, first down. What could possibly come after a liver smoothie, Chris? Well, that's, that, that's, that's only twice a week. Every okay. day he goes in, and after his practice, he does a 30-minute stretch. He's very meticulous about it. Has two stretches per muscle group, cold tub, and then acupuncture once a week, which kind of makes me wonder. I tried to get you some liver smoothies, but what was the strangest Over thing you water. ever did to your post-recovery routine? I didn't have a post recovery routine. I think I would have taken muscle fatigue over liver smoothies, quite frankly. That sounds horrendous. Colburn hit. No, they're not selling liver smoothies here at the stadium no. in honor of Christian Kirk. Tyrell Dodson with the tackle for Texas A&M. More than 550 yards this afternoon in the first half. Wolford incomplete. Bachman couldn't bring it in, and it's fourth down. Need another punt block, maybe? We'll oh see. My. We'll All see the points. What, see what AM has in store right here, whether they set up a return for Christian Kirk, which is not a bad idea. But after you've blocked two, maybe they come after the punt again. This one gets away. Kirk has to fair catch it from the 15. Tomorrow on ESPN, bowl action continues. The PlayStation Fiesta Bowl, Washington and Penn State. And then at 8 o'clock, Wisconsin and Miami, the Capital One Orange Bowl after the PlayStation Fiesta Bowl. Miami's at home and they need it. They've lost a couple, yeah. uh, lost some skill players to injury as well. Both games on the ESPN app. But uh, some of the best games we've seen are from the teams just outside of the college football playoff. And... We're going to see USC at Ohio State coming up later. A good year Cotton Bowl Classic. 
Starkle has played the entire game, and that is incomplete. He went over the middle, and a big hit from Cameron Glenn on Rashad Paul, who's not had a catch so far today. And a nice job by Starkle getting through his progression. He started to the left, worked back to the right, and Paul just simply dropped that football over the middle. Soft coverage by Wake forcing AM and Starkle to be efficient in that pass game and Texas A&M just simply hasn't been able to do that consistently. Starkle hit and dropped. Wendell Dunn with the sack. And what a story this young man is. The red shirt senior part of the group that has really turned around Wake Forest. And Dunn is just going to come off the edge. He's a four-year starter, a two-time captain, and loops from the left edge up the middle and miscommunication up front by a rather young offensive line from Texas A&M. Edge of four. Got around his waist and incomplete from Starkle. So edge of four and Dunn together got to the quarterback on that drive. Speaking of special teams shenanigans, Trapuka's obviously backed up and is going to have to get this one off rather quickly. He does. Jesse Bates, who had the great return last time with the fair catch. Wake Forest with a lively offensive first half. Over and out of running, into space. End zone. One to return, and he does in a big way. Jesse Bates for Wake Forest. Old gold and black throughout this stadium. 35 plays, 331 yards, 31 points. My goodness, what a turnaround for Wake. It's pretty similar to the military <laughs> no, ball last no year. No kidding. I mean, the military ball, ball through this the start of this game, and you've seen those kind of numbers put up by this offense. Wolford ridden down. Landis Durham with the sack. And that's an area that Wake has gotten so much better at. They cut their sacks in half, 36 sacks a year ago, and Chris talked about how much John Wolford, the quarterback, has been beat up over the course of his career. Only 17 coming into this game. Literally split the sack total in half. Wolford finds a seam, and he dives ahead. This is an offensive line that was much maligned coming into the season, but they have a board in their room, their uh, meeting room, that says D-H-O-P on it, D-Hop. stands for Deacon House of Pancakes. Nice, they, I like that. They have a list of pancake blocks on that board, and growing pride in that unit. Wolford, Serenay. And the future NFL tight end, Cam Serenay, scores. That's a pretty good-looking player right there. I certainly think he'll be playing on Sundays, and John Wolford has gotten comfortable with him over the years. Actually was entertained by... Serenay on his recruiting trip and they've been best of friends ever since but a security blanket for a quarterback over the middle and yet another young defender in Keldrick Carper the safety from Texas A&M took a bad angle Serenay secures it and comes out the other side and remember Texas A&M is without Derek Tucker one of its starting safeties because of targeting in the LSU game he's out for the first half and he's likely bouncing off the walls in that locker room wanting to get out of here, but A&M only has three healthy safeties for this first half, and this is a play that that might have helped to have some depth. And Wake Forest will use Camp Serenay in a lot of different ways. He's flexed out 
in that bunch set, and he's just going to work the middle of the field, and it's up to John Wolford to get him the football if he's open. That big body is not afraid of catching it between the hashes. And you can see it right there, and then he comes out the other side. So it's secure the football, beat the underneath coverage. The safety over the top takes a bad angle, and Serenay, the big tight end, comes out the other side and ends up in the end zone for Wake Forest. Cam Serenay, who grew up a very close friend, who's still very close, Trace McSorley, the Penn State quarterback, and uh, Cam Serenay just changes this offense. Yeah. When you have a big body that can work between the hashes, and then you're coming up with some more explosive guys out on the perimeter, that's why Wake Forest has looked so much different offensively this season. Flag comes in as this is short of the 40-yard line, Keith Ford. On the return for AM. Jason Kim Serene is part of the five redshirt seniors that came to school. First out. First out. Jason Camp Serene is part of the five redshirt seniors that came here in 2013, the last year of Jim Grove. Serene told me yesterday that it was a tough first couple seasons, but that Coach Clausen tried to get them to believe. He said it was going to be on us to change the culture. We wanted to change the way that we did things here. No more off the field issues. We knew that if we could change things, that would be what we hung our hat on. And in fact, Serene was John Wolford's host when he came, and that's what he told him. Come here, you can be a part of this. And they have, and they've grown a program that really struggled for a couple of seasons. Oh, beautiful play by Cameron Glenn, but a flag comes in. He was wrapped around Kirk, but that is as clean of a, at least hand-wise, pass breakup as you're going to see. Yeah, it seemed like it, and I think they oh, might get oh, Glenn. Defense, number two, 10-yard penalty by rule, automatic first down. That's before the pass. Yeah, and so Kirk was going to the post. Again, we've seen Texas A&M do this multiple times. No safety in the middle of the field. Kirk runs a post, and that happened way early when Kirk was coming out of his break and going to the post because the holding means the football wasn't in the air yet. It wasn't about the contact by Glenn at the end of that play. Starkle over the middle. Osborn, first down, Texas A&M. And more of the same. Wake Forest is forcing Texas A&M offensively to prove that they can find those voids, secure the football, and do it a number of times in order to get points. And A&M has not been up to that task yet in this half. Caught by Kirk in traffic, and Christian Kirk to the 45 in Wake Forest territory. What a weapon he is, a junior out of Scottsdale and Saguaro High School. And we're going to have a whistle before defender. the next snap. It's Amari Henderson, the Wake Forest corner, who's hurt. But on Christian Kirk, you remember back in 2015, 10 catches in the bowl game against Louisville. Two plus catches in every game, and you know, he's going to be a pro whenever he chooses to. And Chris reported earlier that, hey, the coaching change makes him maybe think, you know, Jimbo Fisher has a pedigree of putting guys in the NFL. Not that Kevin Sumlin didn't, because he certainly did as well. But uh, decision to be made for Christian Kirk. Yeah, and out of Jimbo Fisher, maybe more of a, a pro-style offensive system that may matter to Christian Kirk. But I think Christian Kirk, is, his numbers are down a little bit this year, I think, mainly because he's playing with a lot of newbies, a lot of freshmen and redshirt freshmen. His run game has been banged up, and he's gone through two quarterbacks. Both of them are freshmen, so it's not easy. Starko lost the football. Wake Forest is on it. Justin Sternod, the redshirt sophomore, the strip. <laughs> Well, Sternod just gets around the end so quickly from his outside linebacker position out of this 4-2-5. And once again, remember up front for Texas A&M, at any one time, there are three true freshmen up front. And you saw it on that play. It was a line, or actually a running back that was based on the design of that pass play and protection. A running back came up to 
Sternod and threw a shoe duster. Didn't keep his head up to see the defender, and Sternod goes around and gets to the football. A shoe duster? Shoe duster. That's when you're looking at the ground and not looking at what you want to block, and the running back did that on that play. Colburn waiting for a door to open, and Dalen Mack, the former Under Armour All-American, the junior with the stop, a five-star recruit who originally committed to A&M, then decommitted, then committed again, and boy, are they happy he did. Second down, Colburn. As we check in with the studio, Reese Davis. Jason, assuming you guys finish with all the scoring and actually get to halftime, we'll have the Mercedes-Benz halftime report and update on Baker Mayfield's condition as he is battling some type of sickness and also look ahead to the Cotton Bowl between USC and Ohio State. Mac Brown and David Pollock here at the Rose Bowl. We'll see you in just a bit. We're trying to get it to you. We just want you to have a little more opportunity to get those scripts ready and get the video ready and all that. We we can tell you that this is already the highest scoring first half of any bowl game this year. And the add-on may be coming to the sideline batted away from Washington. Charles Oliver, who had the earlier touchdown, swatted it. And he is down. Oliver had been called for a pass interference earlier because he didn't find the football in the air. And this time, Charles Oliver does a tremendous job. That's exactly the way you should play it. The receiver will tell you when the ball is coming. Don't panic. Turn and find the ball at the same time the receiver has to turn and find it. When Scotty Washington looks back, Charles Oliver needs to look back and make an equal or better play on the football. And Oliver does all of that on that play. Charles Oliver in his ninth start of the season for AM. He had the touchdown off the punt block. Anytime you lose a guy like Miles Garrett, your defense might have something of a drop off. And we'll see what the future holds for John Chavis, the defensive coordinator for Texas AM. We had Jimbo Fisher up in the booth earlier. Questions about maybe another move for John Chavis and where he might end up. A lot of speculation, which he told us he's well aware that we're aware of it, <laughs> but wasn't willing to confirm or deny it. But a lot of rumors that Chad Morris may be interested in a John Chavis to join him rebuilding that Arkansas program. Just speculation and rumors, though. Just Nothing speculation and rumors. Maggio gets it away. Christian Kirk waves for the fair catch and bails out of the way. Wake Forest couldn't down it. So AM gets it from the 20 yard line. And this could be a very important possession for the Aggies down 17 late in the first down. Yeah, and that's why that bounce of that punt was important for Noel Mazzoni, the play caller at Texas AM. If you're backed up, you certainly may not want to start anything here, but now it's the prototypical two-minute drill. 2.17 left. Give Nick Starkles an opportunity to get something done in this short situation. You know, we've not seen Kellen Mond so far, and, and the opinion was that we were going to see both Starkle yeah. and Mond today, but only one quarterback for AM. The run game has not been there so far this afternoon. Starko has a completion to Buckley, the freshman. You can basically just assume it's a freshman making the catch if it's not Ratley and Kirk. If it's, yeah, not number three or number four, it's a freshman of some variety. Starko, completion to Kendrick Rogers, another one of those freshmen who has... A Texas A&M first down to the 40-yard line. Two timeouts remaining for the Aggies. And Nick Starko, the richer freshman quarterback, needs to have a little more sense of urgency. Get to the line of scrimmage. The cl clock stop stops briefly on the first down. But you have to have the play call and have you guys done moving around so you can save three or four seconds every snap. 
Starkle sideline. Beautifully done by Ratley to get the foot down. Inside Wake Forest territory past the 30. Fade routes are so often won or lost at the line of scrimmage, and Ratley gets by the defender very quickly and Bassey that time. It's one at the line of scrimmage, get on top of the defender, and then hope your quarterback drops it in your shirt pocket. Starkle did. First down AM. Wake can't get there. Starkle a timing route. And that was held up. Buckley couldn't get to the spot because of Kobe Davis and the contact. So it's second down. And that's the way you defend really a fade route. You get physical with it, and it breaks up the timing. And that was Buckley was a slot receiver running what they call the inside fade. So he's just going to bend outside and go to the back of the pylon and impeded by the defender that time. But you have to do all of what I just said without getting Second called for A, either pass interference or B, holding. Uh, it seems very difficult to do. A&M a &M burns a timeout. It's not likely they'll need the timeout, so this seems to be one of those spots where Jeff Banks, as the interim head coach, has decided, hey, let's huddle up and talk it over before we do something that's... Silly? Yeah, a little silly. Untimely? Untimely as well. Inefficient? You done yet? Goodyear Cotton Bowl Classic, AT&T Stadium in Arlington, Sam Darnold in USC, JT Barrett and the Buckeyes, 8.30 Eastern, 5.30 Pacific. I, so you're advising Sam Darnold, right? Yeah. You're, you're his advisor. Yeah, just be, be glad you're not the number five team is what yeah, I'm telling exactly. Sam Darnold. Yeah, what are you going to ask me about Darnold? You're advising him. Yeah. As a top five pick in the first round grade. Yeah. You sending him out or you telling him to come back and play college football? That's Think tough. about that a second. Yeah, I will. $22 million guaranteed. Starkle incomplete. I, I think you go out. You're a top three quarterback. I mean, it's Josh Allen, Sam Darnold, and Josh Rosen. You want to play Cleveland? I don't personally, but... Rosen apparently doesn't either. That was fairly obvious uh, in some of his comments. Those are all questions that these 22-year-olds are needing to answer. I yeah. hope they have First great sure, people to Forest. speak into their lives. Seconds. Time out, Wake Forest. Yeah. Uh, you know, the thing about Cleveland is if you're going to be one of the top quarterbacks in the country. Go make a difference. You are going to play for a bad NFL team. True. That is how the draft works. So at some point, and I know Eli Manning's done it and other This other is a really people. good trade, right? But, but, I mean, I'm talking to a guy here who didn't want to specifically play for an NFL team. You. Because that was of more some about circumstance. contract negotiations than it was not wanting to play for the St. Louis, soon to become Arizona Cardinals. You just didn't want to play for who was negotiating with exactly. you. Exactly. It was all about that. But you're exactly right. But what leverage does a player coming out of college have entering the draft? The answer is none other than to withhold your service. Okay, your services. And so if Rosen wants to do that, somewhat like or send the message like an Eli Manning did. If you have the leverage to do it, that's the only chip you have to put on the table. Starkle rolling and throwing for the first down. Kendrick Rogers, the freshman who came in with just eight catches on the year, keeps the drive alive. And a boatload of time. A&M still has one timeout, just getting to a minute left in this first half. To the 10, Ford, edge of four with the stop. The defensive end, who's a descendant of Nigerian royalty, Duke edge of four. I would like to see Starkle moving with a little more urgency. That's the second time I've said it on this drive, but now we're nearing 30 seconds one time out. You don't have all the time in the world. Starkle, end zone, batted away by Isang Bassi. Tucked in with Rodgers, it's third down. 
Bassey making a great play to the fade, and that's typically where the next throw is the back shoulder. When Bassey, the corner, overplays the fade to the corner of the end zone, you throw to the back shoulder. Starkle may go to that right here, or where is number three Christian Kirk deep in the red zone? Right now he's lined up in the backfield. Kirk is to the right of Starkle, forward to Starkle's left. Kirk, touchdown! The wheel for a score for AM. Christian Kirk lines up in the backfield. No Mazzoni, the play caller for AM, is trying to hide number three because everyone on the planet knows this guy's the touchdown maker. Runs an angle route, and this ball literally hits him in the face mask. You talk about Starkle and anticipatory throwing, but the catch by Christian Kirk, when you turn around and you, something hits you in the face and you decide you better catch it, that's the football. That's good hands. Yeah, great hands. Christian Kirk climbing the lists for Texas A&M. Jeff Fuller and Josh Reynolds only ahead of him. That's 25 in three seasons and a buck 33 in this bowl game. A season high comes in the belt bowl for Christian Kirk. And just an explosive player. And the thing that you asked Noel Mazzoni, and he, he had an interesting answer, the offensive coordinator for A&M is, talking about how NFL ready he is. He's he's always approached the game of football as if he's he's ready to play at that next level. You know, his body is his corporation in a sense. But in terms of X's and O's, does this system that Mazzoni runs prepare a Christian Kirk for the next level? No, Mazzoni talked about how he teaches those kind of guys outside of his system. This is what you're going to expect at the next level. No, Mazzoni has has um, experience coaching in the NFL as well. So it's interesting that that was his answer. Watched a lot of film of other systems as Chuck Wade approaches the ball and Wake Forest will likely just take a couple of knees here with about 15 seconds to go here in half number one. Because Christian Kirk hasn't been the prototypical slot receiver in college football. He's been more of a vertical guy. But I think at the next level, his sweet spot is going to be playing in the slot, being a mismatch against really anyone who tries to cover him. Your third best corner in the NFL or a safety, Christian Kirk will win that matchup most of the time. Well, you saw it. This is the highest scoring first half in any bowl game this season. 66 points. Each team has 300 plus yards. We're nearly at 700 total. And what will be in store for the final 30 minutes here in Charlotte at the Belt Bowl? 38 28 is your halftime number. Wake Forest averages 33 points a game. Texas AM about 31 points a game. This has been quite the first half in lovely Charlotte. Downstairs, Chris Button with Dave Clawson. Coach, down early, you went on a 31.1. What changed for your offense? Well, when you run tempo, you got to make first downs. And so, you know, the first few drives, we didn't make any first downs. Once we made a first down and we get our tempo going, John gets in a rhythm. We started moving the football. They get a piece of their secondary back with Derek Tucker. How does that change what you've been able to do against them? We're going to run our offense. It's game 13. You don't change things up in the second half. Thank you. Thank you. That's Dave Clawson, Wake Forest head coach, 38-28, Mercedes-Benz halftime. Reese Davis back Brown, David Pollock after the break. Welcome back to Capital One Bowl Mania. This is the Belt Bowl as part of Capital One Bowl Mania. And if you want offense, we got offense for you. 38-28, Wake Forest with the lead over Texas A&M. Jason Benetti, Kelly Stauffer, Chris Budden is downstairs. So uh, 
How many points does it's it exactly take? Exactly what we had planned, it, right? It is. Uh, uh, how many points does it take? I'm not sure, but one of our keys to the game was the first team to have 90 plays would win this game, and they're ahead. Of, both of them are ahead of pace right now. 38-28 is your halftime score right now, and uh, John Wolford continues his magnificent season in his senior year, highest scoring first half of the bowl season. And a and uh, has not allowed this many. And remember, Wake didn't do anything on their first two drives, and then they got going. And then when Nick Starkle, the quarterback for Texas A&M, found Christian Kirk, six catches, 133 yards, and a couple of touchdowns, that's not a bad plan in the second half either. So it, this is going to be interesting, but I think there are more points to come. Careful on that limb. <laughs> Pretty safe, right? <laughs> We're supposed to say right. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I was thinking it. Oh. Uh, Wake Forest with a very healthy contingent of folks from down the road. It's about an hour, 15, hour and a half drive to Charlotte. And the Demon Deacons will have it first out of halftime. Another kick that's not exactly what you might want. And Wade on the return. Chris Button got a chance to talk to the interim head coach, Jeff Banks, for Texas A&M. Chris? He does, and he likes to employ the message of the underdog. He said, down 10 points with the six penalties and the two interceptions. I knew if we could be close at half that things would change in the second half, and a lot of that is because getting back Derek Tucker in the secondary. He said, even his presence out here completely changes our defense and the energy out here. He said, offensively, they were going to plan on playing Kellen Mund. He said, the run game just hasn't been there, so we want to stick with Starkle in his arm. So there's the reason why we've only seen the one quarterback for Jeff Banks in this Texas A&M offense. Kellen Munn, a quarterback for Texas A&M, could actually give you a little more in the run game. You could think that way as well, but there's a sack. Landis Durham on top of Wolford. Texas A&M started defensively getting at Walford to start this game, and then Wake Forest started to block better. Walford got going and got in that rhythm, but not on that play there. And that's who Texas A&M, 40 sacks coming into this one. Tabari Hines across the 20. So you've seen tape of John Wolford. What do you think in person? He's impressive. His decision making is is absolutely spot on. His feet have improved so much from a year ago. And Chris talked about the fact that this guy has been beaten up for three years to stand in there and deliver the ball like he has is very impressive in person. Here he goes, and it's incomplete. A bullet off of Scotty Washington, and Texas A&M gets the stop that it needs to start this third quarter. And that is a split-second decision. It, that's the, the prototypical run-pass option, and Scotty Washington took a shot as that ball went through his hands, and he's still down. But it's a run-pass option based on what a defender does. You have to, if you're the quarterback, make a split-second decision, and Wofford has been so good at doing that this entire season. That was a great decision, a really good throw, and it just was not able to be corralled by Scotty Washington. I mean, the, Jason, as a quarterback, this is all you can do. Now, this came out a little high and really hot, and Washington does not get the hands up and then gets one right in the ribs by Tucker. And there is the guy that Chris was talking about, Derek Tucker, involved in the play, getting out of that locker room after the targeting penalty. I mean, he was in there with the equipment manager, essentially, during the first half, basically saying, let me out, let me out, let me out. And he said the opportunity. Out. They did. They let him out, and he blew up Scotty Washington. And, and Derek Tucker is a freshman that has really set the tone on the back end in coverage all year long. For Texas A&M and so when you take that free safety that piece of the puzzle out 
you lose a lot because then the dominoes start to fall and you get a lot of young players playing in positions they're not accustomed to playing. At least they don't have a great deal of experience playing in those positions. Maggio has been under siege today. Couple blocked and here a and sets up a return. This is the guy to do it. Christian Kirk backpedaling to the 20. He's got a touchdown earlier and Kirk winds his way out of bounds as we check in with Reese Davis. I'm Reese Davis' studio update brought to you by Great Clips. The Valero Alamo Bowl last night. TCU once down 21 to 3, 3 and change to go, and Cole Bunce gets 3. That proved to be the gamer. The Horned Frogs come from behind to win it by a deuce. Gary Patterson going with the purple shirt early. <laughs> And in the end, they end up pulling it off. Remember that a couple of years ago, the down 31 at halftime, he switches shirts and all of a sudden they win the game. I don't recall what shirt he finished in, but it worked. The magic shirt. The magic Gary shirt. Gary Patterson. Gary Patterson, no doubt about it. Starkle to Jamon Osborne. And that short passing game has basically been it so far for a &M today. What Wake Forest is saying defensively is we're going to give you a few things in that pass game, but you're going to have to efficiently drive the ball methodically in the pass game in order to get points. They had Kirk in the backfield along with Travion Williams, and Williams is on the move inside the 20. Jesse Bates tracked him down. The explosive run game for Texas A&M is what has been missing most of the year, at least consistently. And Williams is front and center in that. The explosive plays in the run game, and then a young passing game to go along with it. Sideline route for Buckley. So Jason, that's another thing that Noel Mazzoni told us, is the running backs have been banged up, and at times they have three true freshmen up front on that offensive line for Texas A&M. Those aren't the ingredients for a really consistently good run game. Kirk with a stiff arm, and Kirk is in! What a run! All of what you see from Christian Kirk on this play translates to the next level. Get the guy the ball in space. He's physical, he has quick feet, and he gets the most out of that play. Those things will work well if indeed Christian Kirk does decide to go to the NFL after this game. Remember Dave Clawson told us who will win, two, three, and four on their side, or two, three, exactly. and four in our secondary, and that was three on three. Kirk against Bates, and Kirk got the stiff arm for the victory that time around. AM down only three, and the celebration is on. Starkle to Kirk for the score, and Christian Kirk, maybe in his last game as an Aggie, brings it within three. This is the Belt Bowl as part of Capital One Bowl Mania. And we mentioned earlier that each player gets a $450 gift card to go to Belk and the store here in Charlotte, a four-level store, to go spend on whatever they want, as long as the coaches let them in terms of what section is open. And every year, the jewelry section, based on the coach's decision, has been closed. I was talking about that earlier, and I used a poor choice of words. So I apologize if that, that it did create a negative sentiment based on what I said. It's the coach's decision to close any section of the store. So that's what I meant by that. 38-35, Wake Forest with the lead over Texas A&M. 12.51 to go third quarter, and uh, we have had quite the offensive display oh today. Goodness. Yeah, we talked about the first offensive team to 90 plays will win this one, and they have six-man football still in Nebraska, and a lot of times it's it's a lot of plays, but it's the last team to touch the football that actually wins the game. We might be looking at kind of a six-man version of football playing with 11 out here right now. 
It's looked like 11 on six offense versus defense for a good chunk of this game, Chris Button. Jason, as the team was coming out, as uh, there was a group of Aggies players who got together and said, we need to change our dynamic on the sidelines. There's too many one-on-one -on -one conversations. We need to have more energy. And there has been a noticeable difference from the first half to the second half. Even Noel Mazzoni getting in on the energy down here. Well, Noel's got some energy that he didn't expend all of it on Kelly Stoffer when he was coaching him. Although he did say they pulled you into the tunnel and uh, chewed yeah. you out a little bit. Yeah, he did. He read me the riot act one time. It's the only time he raised his voice at me, and it was good for me at that time, but I certainly learned my lesson. He didn't need to do it a second time. Durham was after Wolford. He got away. John Wolford leans into the contact, put the ball on the deck. And it looks like it's going to be Wake Forest football as Otaro Alaka, the junior out of Houston, sprung it free. And the ball actually comes up a little bit short. And John Wolford, I've seen this on tape, he's not your sliding kind of quarterback. And he's getting the first down right here. That ball comes out, and Serene is the tight end that jumps on it. Landis Durham was close, but he didn't really see the ball. Uh, there was like. about five different Aggies that could have come up with that one, and that would have been a big play, obviously, early in this second half. Fourth down and one, and the punt team is on. Christian Kirk, one on five. And even though he is superhuman at times, he's not going to do anything with that one. So Texas A&M down three and a volcanic offensive display gets it back. The Belt Bowl, brought to you by the Quicksilver card from Capital One. Earn unlimited 1.5% cash back every purchase everywhere. Overton's, America's marine and water sports superstore. And Ford, going further so you can. As part of the giving back to the community in the Belt Bowl, players help bag over 1,500 sacks of grocery items that go to different agencies to assist people in need. Second Harvest Food Bank. 11.3 million pounds of food every year in Mecklenburg County. And Jeff Banks, the interim head coach for Texas A&M, has got his team back within three. And with the ball, looking for the sideline and incomplete is Christian Kirk. And second down coming up. And Chris Button told us that Amari Henderson, the Richard sophomore corner for Wake Forest, it will miss the second half due to a concussion. So it's getting pretty thin on the back end, regardless of which team you're rooting for right now. So receivers for both teams are going to have an opportunity here in this second half with making plays down the field. Up the middle, first down, Keith Ford. Gated 12 for an AM run game that did not have a great first half. In fact, negative rushing yards in the first half, negative seven. Short gain for Ford. Wendell done with the stop. A young man who is a redshirt senior, part of that redshirt senior class, and a tremendous story. He has essentially adoptive parents who took him in in Miami. And they have since moved to the Nashville area, but they are basically the folks who brought him up late in his high school life. As Starkle throws incomplete to the outside for Paul. That's is incomplete intended for the shot, Paul. Jason, it's really an incredible story. His junior year, he moved in with those parents, Jen and Jeff, and he calls them mama and papa, and because of what they've done to them, he wants to pay it forward. So he now teaches an eighth grade literacy class. He specifically picked out eighth grade because it was the time that he met them. What an awesome story. There is. They're at the game. They travel to every Wake Forest home game and most of the road games as well. Kirk, great hand 
Titans to haul that pass in. Yeah, this ball was thrown way behind Christian Kirk as he comes into the that void in that Wake Forest defensive zone again and makes a great catch on the ball well behind him. So now the run game, see if they can get that revved up. Travion Williams on the carry. So with Christian Kirk, you have the speed to get vertical. He's a great returner, and he catches the ball outside of his body, and he makes me, people miss in space. I mean, that's an NFL receiver, no doubt about it. Another quick set this time. It's Buckley as Demetrius Kemp, the linebacker, collaborates with Bates, and it's third down. And Texas A&M wants to go fast as well. They haven't been as efficient today, so they haven't gone as fast. But sometimes when the running game in the box isn't working well, the screen game, the quick screen game for a lot of these teams in college football now essentially become the run game. So Kellen Mond, speaking of the run game, is in. The reserve quarterback, the freshman out of San Antonio, our first look at him this afternoon. And Mond gave it up to Williams, who got rocked by Carlos Basham. And just not blocked well at the point of attack, but right here, almost to the 50-yard line, would be a time I think Texas A&M may go for it on fourth down. It looks as though they're going to go ahead and punt. Remember, bull shenanigans. Yeah. They can show up at any time, and we haven't seen a lot of the gadget stuff out in A&M, but this is a prototypical time in the game and a place on the field that you could see something up right here. Drapuka. To the 16 and Jesse Bates who doesn't have a chance to return this one Capital One Bowl mania later on one more game 430 Eastern 130 Pacific Kentucky and number 21 Northwestern the Franklin American Mortgage Music City Bowl also available on the ESPN app Justin Jackson and Ron Dane the only Big Ten players to gain more than a thousand yards in their first four seasons. They're only four seasons. Texas A&M is drawn within three thanks to a plus 90 this quarter. Tabari Hines on the short pass game for Wake Forest, a team that in the first two seasons for Dave Clawson didn't go to a bowl, but look, there have only been twice in terms of times in Wake Forest history now where they've been to back to back bowl games in recent memory that great run in the mid 2000s and now as this run is our team bird the freshman to set up third down Dave Clawson who spent five years at Bowling Green four at Richmond five at Fordham in his 18th season as a college head coach has done a really nice job with Wake Forest as Wolford goes to the sideline and has a first down for Bachman. Alex Bachman brings it in. This is a throw that John Wolford does not make a year ago. Really? Yeah, he just sets his feet, makes a great decision, and then from the middle of the field throws an accurate ball on an out route. That didn't happen much a year ago. Bird again clanging off the tacklers to the 31. Jason, Clemens the stop. Excuse me. Dave Clawson talked to us about this yesterday. They made a conscious effort in the bowl game a year ago during bowl prep to go fast and commit to the RPO scheme. And John Walford has taken that and run wild with it. Bird breaks a tackle. And he's out of bounds just before the 45 run out by Tucker, the freshman at the safety spot. So the run pass option scheme and then you go fast with it is is literally that you have a run or a pass based on reading one defender every play. But you have to do it quickly from the quarterback position. How quickly like instantaneously pump and go Wolford Bachman inside the 10. Walford faked, actually pumped to the now screen, the quick screen outside, and then Bachman 
Made a stutter move and then went vertical on Miles Jones, the true freshman corner. And Bachman got the best of the youngster outside on that play. Oh, Tabari Hines had a touchdown that he was staring down the barrel of and couldn't hang on. I think Hines was seeing the corner of the end zone before he actually saw the football into his hands. Larry Pryor was the safety coming from the inside out, and Hines was going to beat him to the corner of the end zone if he caught the ball. Wolford incomplete out of the reach of Serene. So now third down for Wake Forest is Wolford. I had looked, the, the run pass option has hurt Texas A&M in bowl games previously. Lamar Jackson, Jesse Ertz the last couple years. It's been the arm of Wolford so far today that has done most of the damage for him. Wolford incomplete. Cortez Lewis couldn't finish the catch. And Jones along with Tucker and Tyrell Dodson were in the area. So fourth down for Wake, which has been a blocked kick nightmare this afternoon. And Mike Weaver is coming on to kick this. But if you're Texas A&M, that's how you have to defend Wake's offense. And a lot of college offenses this day and age, you can give up some stuff, some yards between the 20s, but you bear down and play good defense in the red zone, and you take seven off the board and force them to try to kick it for a three as Mike Weaver attempts to do right now. Weaver from 27. Total points or total yards in college football this day and age mean next to nothing. It's all about what, how you defend the red zone. Which A&M did, although Bachman got him there. 41-35, Texas A&M holds the line, just allowing three. All ESPN coverage is streaming live on the ESPN app. Download now and take ESPN everywhere. This is what bowl season is about. I, we told you off the top that it's about sometimes an interim head coach and sometimes a senior who nearly lost his job a bunch of different times and it's simply about the entertainment of 41 35 so far in the first two quarters plus here in Charlotte but Jeff Banks has kept his team interested even after they got punched to the jaw in the first half and there was a lot of speculation Kelly you know Kevin Sumlin leaves the players loved him will will this team maybe fold up right yeah they give up 31 straight and then bounce back that 31 straight was was the opportunity for anybody on Texas A&M sideline to just say I've had enough and I think those players rallied Chris talked about the, the energy went up you know, they had individual conversations going on, and all of a sudden it became a team thing. And let's do it one more time together with this coaching staff and see what happens. Jeff Banks has said, as there's a Wake Forest player injured, Jeff Banks said to us yesterday, he said, look, I've been talking to Kevin Sumlin a lot. Yeah. He, he sees him as a mentor. They're both uh, disciples of Mike Price and said look it's it's basically been nightly they've been talking about what to do and just the development of banks as the interim coach and what to implement and he's made his own decisions as well and the former punter has shown well in terms of motivation I, one of the things that he really drew on last night he said was this team's an underdog yeah and he's going to try and beat that into their heads for this game to to make them think of themselves as the underdog and do everything they can to wipe that away. Yeah, his entire roster came to Texas A&M to do one thing, win championships in the SEC and nationally. And so the pride of that program is what he drew on. We're a three point underdog to Wake Forest. Banks has also called on some vocal leadership from the players. Christian Kirk telling me during this bowl prep, he's been more vocal than usual, especially with the younger guys. They have a lot of questions. What's going on? Who's coming back? Who's leaving? And he feels like it's been on his shoulders to help those guys forget about everything else that's going on off the field and to really pay attention to the bowl preparation. 
That's a great time for the experienced guys to step up because it is the, the young, inexperienced college athletes that they don't really know how to respond to a situation like this. I mean, Sumlin and this coaching staff were the ones that brought them and started them in their college career. So they're gone. Now what happens to us? Travion Williams cuts it upfield. He's got an A&M first down. And now the tailbacks are getting involved as Christian Kirk is down on the sideline. And that is awful news in a number of ways. Yeah, and Christian Kirk was simply outside working hard as a perimeter wide receiver blocking for Williams who was headed his direction with the football and got rolled up on it seemed like after that play. I mean, Kirk is doing what he should do and oh. then it's that left ankle that Travion Williams rolls on and you can see Williams, if we can go back to that shot, you can see Williams knows it yeah. right away. He looks over at Kirk before the play's really even over with, knowing that he just rolled on Christian Kirk's ankle. You can almost hear the chorus of people saying, this is why you don't play in the bowl games and all that, and, yeah. and it's too bad because... Card is coming over for Christian Kirk, and yeah, Williams knew it. The card has stopped now, and Kirk got himself up, which is really good news. And actually is walking much better than I anticipated. And the cart literally was onto the field. And Christian Kirk jumps up and waves them off. And I think those liver smoothies are kicking in. <laughs> that is a great sign. Yeah, that is. Because he's actually moving quite well. It'll be interesting to see if we see him again. But that is great news because that looked horrific when it happened. And his running back, Travion Williams, knew it instantly. This is incomplete for Osmond. And the ramifications of a Christian Kirk injury involve players in the future playing in bowl games. And you see something like that. And maybe that tilts your decision, even though it's a it's a small probability you get hurt in any specific game severely. It's good to see Kirk up for his own sake and also for the future ramifications as there's the run game. Travion Williams got belted. Cameron Glenn came in along with Dawson, but it's a first down for A&M. I think Texas A&M's willingness to be patient in the pass game going outside as we have yet another Texas A&M player down. Obviously, you don't want to see this, and that run game has been more prevalent in this second half because of the patience in the passing game in the first half by Texas A&M. Cameron Glenn came in with the helmet and hit Williams hard, Gil. But you're right, the run game has started to turn up a little bit, and... And Trivion Williams had a great freshman season, over a thousand yards, and he brings that explosive ability to the run game. When you spread them out, you go fast, and you have an explosive running back. But Williams has been nicked up this year, as has Keith Ford, and so they no Mazzoni hasn't gotten as much out of the run game in 2017 as the prior season, and you certainly don't want to see this, but Travion Williams is a finisher of runs, doesn't shy away from contact, and you saw it on that play. The question is, crown of the helmet. If Cameron Glenn came in with the crown of his helmet, we could have a targeting penalty here. Yeah, and it's hard to see on that look. Remember, it's the crown of the helmet because we don't have a defenseless player. Travion Williams is a ball carrier, isn't in that defenseless category, and so does that leading with the crown of the helmet actually take place by Cameron Glenn? It's hard to see on those. Remember, that 
that penalty can now be as of this year be initiated by the replay booth. Yep. I don't know that there's enough there to do that though. Uh, remember too that in the rule it's written as when in doubt it is targeting. Right. So if you're 50 50 essentially that's that's what that means if you're 50 50 throw the flag throw, well or or stop it and call it targeting from the booth exactly. either way either way. Yeah. And it's a player safety issue is the why that it why that it's designed that way and and not that an injury would lead you to call targeting. It, it, the result should not have anything to do with whether or not targeting is called. That's a great point. However, with a player down, you're a human, right? Yeah, Your exactly. mind might lean that direction. Let's see what happens on the other side. Williams is down, and we'll see when we come back. Back to Charlotte. Travion Williams off the field, and Nick Starkle. Throws an interception. I mean, that was right to Jabari Williams for Wake Forest. This is a classic case of having doubts when you have pressure. Starkle goes to pull the trigger, but he has pressure in his face. And right at the last second, he has doubts that he should throw it. And it only goes about half as far as he wanted to. In this case, it was right in the midst of Jabari Williams. It was Rodney that had the pressure and as a quarterback that little split second of indecision. I have the pressure. Should I just eat this ball or you try to keep the play alive and make something happen. Then you bail out of the throw and it ends up in the, the midst of a defender been there before. You don't want to be there though. No you don't. Colburn for a game of two. And Jason the, the thing is is you as a fan you're saying. How in the world do you throw it right to the guy where you're throwing a projectile from one point to the other and if you have some indecision in the throw then it doesn't go where you want and I know that Nick Starkle wanted that ball back as soon as he let it go. Tyrell Dodson is the injured party for Texas A&M. Dodson a sophomore linebacker. He was always uh, strong. His family tells the story at age seven or eight, he used to break tops off two liter drinks and break doorknobs. So you kind of knew you had a was football he player. Spinach or what was he? <laughs> what was he doing there? Maybe liver smoothies. Wow. I don't know. Popeye. There's a video of him squatting 675 pounds. Wow. That went viral. Had over 200,000 views of it and. That is incredible to say the least. Popeye used to do that though. He wasn't a great squatter until he popped another can of spinach and then all of a sudden he's squatting all over the place. You're talking like you've met him and he's a fictional character. I grew up watching. I kind of feel like I know the guy. He's not real. Uh -huh. But anyway back to Dotson <laughs> squatting 675 pounds is impressive. That's the moral of my story. And a good moral it was. Tyrell Dodson coming off the field. Started every game this year. Leading tackler out of Franklin, Tennessee. He's another great story as well. His dad left. He and his mother, 11 years old. Yeah. And the compassion out of that young man toward. Peop, young people, they said, is incredibly impressive, and a man that can squat, squat 60, 75 but still show that kind of compassion is pretty incredible. Well, that's a big hit on Colburn from Tucker. Chris, you got an update on Wake? Scotty Washington back on the field. I believe that's where Chris was going to go. If we had the opportunity. Good speed for this offense, right, Chris? Tempo the Wake Forest has caused some problems for AM. Fourth down and two. And Wake's gonna go. Wolford finds some room and has the first down. Oh, that looked doomed right off the top. And he does get the first down. 
and it looked messy inside, but that was a design quarterback power run by Wake Forest, and it looked messy at first, and then Wolford was patient and finds enough to convert. Wolford, sideline, Bachman gets lit up and lost the football. Texas A&M with the recovery. Larry Pryor, one of those reserve safeties, recovers it. Pryor is the beneficiary of the true freshman rim up throw. The corner that blows this one up. The, the question is going to be whether this is a completed catch or not. He tucked it. Is that enough for you football move wise? You have to make a play common to the game. Tucking it and trying to get squared up to go uphill, I think qualifies for for that. I think that should be ruled a catch as it was on the field. And the replay booth, as we know, takes an instant look at everything. Keith Ford straight up the cut. Inside the 35. 34 yard gain for the senior. Ford got caught up in the wash from Chris Calhoun, the junior defensive end. And great news for Texas A&M. Christian Kirk is back on the field after the injury just a couple of minutes ago. Yeah, in the slot left. And do not be surprised in this plus situation, plus territory, that Nick Starkle doesn't find him getting quickly onto that safety and getting to the middle of the field once again. Starkle with the hit to Kirk. And there he was. You got a guy like this, you're going to find him. Oh, you got to load him up. There isn't any question. And as soon as they start jumping that kind of a route, he's going to go over the top. Kirk breaks a tackle. Looks like he's feeling okay, huh? Wow. This he's is the way that... Bassey got left in the dust. No kidding. That is quickness at its finest. And that's a. Way you just get the ball to your playmaker in space, let him get squared up and do that. Not many people on earth can do that, however. That's a bullet from Starkle. Ratley breaks a tackle. Ratley fighting inside the five, down to the one. This does not look like a team that has come even close to giving up on a season with a new coach. End zone, incomplete. Bassey the defense on Ratley who had to reach around him to try and make the grab. Yeah, first and goal. I would expect expect him to find Christian Kirk. He split out wide right. We circled him on the play before. Doesn't have a lot of help out there. Wake was substituting. Ford hits Pater. Touchdown. The beauty of pace. Wake, as you said, Jason, was still substituting and there wasn't a whole lot of opposition in that hole for Keith Ford, who got more touches on that drive than he had the whole game because of the injury to Travion Williams earlier in this quarter. So Keith Ford, who's already withstood a coaching change at Oklahoma, that's the reason he went to Texas A&M under the interim coach Jeff Banks, gives the Aggies the lead in his last game. And Keith Ford is more of the physical box runner. And then Trivion Williams is the slasher and explosive guy. But we saw a lot of Ford on that drive. And there was certainly some urgency on his part in his last game with Texas A&M. A&M rushing in the first half, minus seven yards in this third quarter, 111. That's about the only thing that A&M didn't have in that first half was rushing yards. 
Keith Ford right there. First half, not much. And second half, he got it going. And that was on that drive that we just saw. Well, 41's not going to win it today. What will the number be? Both teams are on the edge of 500 yards, Kel. <laughs> You want to you want to put on that passing glove and uh, go out there, don't you? Yeah, this would be either one of these offenses would be fun to play in. Touchback for man. Tomorrow, Capital One Bowl Mania continues noon Eastern on ESPN. Lamar Jackson, another chance to see him against Mississippi State. In the Tax Slayer Bowl, and then ABC 12:30 Eastern, Iowa State and Memphis. It's a home game for the Tigers. In the AutoZone Liberty Bowl, both games available on the ESPN app. And look, Iowa State is the only team in the country still not lost a fumble yet this season. That's pretty incredible. Colburn knocked down Kingsley Kiki with the tackle the junior who started every game this year as well second down for Wake Forest going tempo and a whistle before the snap a rare flag here in the second number half 74 the offense five yard penalty remains second down Phil Haynes, the left guard, moved a little bit early, but it's Anderson, Ryan Anderson, the center. Phil Haynes and Justin Hurran, those three offensive linemen that have grown up in this four years under Dave Clawson as well, and have a lot to be, a lot to do with what Wake is doing offensively in 2017. Scotty Washington. Slipped one tackle and got just across the 30. Miles Jones tackled him after a gain of eight. So which defense is going to make a play here? I'm not sure. Not that they haven't made any. There's been a couple of turnovers, but Wake on third down. About middle of the pack in the country coming in. 39%. Wolford. Sideline, and that is a nasty looking tackle on Bachman by Renfro, the freshman. First down, Wake Forest. When Wake can complete passes like that, they're very difficult to handle. Bump and run coverage outside to run the stop out route, and very good connection by quarterback and receiver on that one. Pump and go, fake the screen. Wolford put it on the deck. And we know who's going to make the big play now. It's Texas A&M with the strip and recovery. And John Wolford is staying down after that hit. Coughed up the football. Made a great decision by not throwing it into coverage. Stepping up inside and trying to make something happen. But not very good ball security by the four-year starter at quarterback. Nothing down the field and Wolford steps up and it's hard to tell what happens there. It didn't look like obviously a vicious hit. Quarterback needs to secure it when you go from a passer to a runner. He got the hand in, just slapped it from the backside. Yeah. Capers Smith. But as a quarterback, when you transition from being a passer in the pocket to a runner downfield, the ball security changes and you have to tuck it three points of pressure and all those things and Wolford still was keeping his head down the field thinking he would throw it but I think he was past the line of scrimmage great day passing as you can tell second straight bowl game he's gotten hurt in last year in the military bowl in Annapolis Wolford was injured in A&M now with a takeaway on two straight possessions Wake Forest already without its top receiver after an ab injury. Greg Dorch was hurt in that Louisville game, the victory for Wake Forest, and now Wolford goes out.
First down for A&M and Starkle. He was rushed. He got it away anyway to Osbin, and a marker has come in back at the 42. Yabari, number 48, might be Personal called for the late hit here. Passer, defense number 48, contact with the face mask of the quarterback, 15 yards added on in the first down. Now sometimes, Jason, those pass rushers get a little frustrated because they get close to the quarterback, but Nick Starkle has been getting rid of the ball quickly. And you can see number 48, Willie Yabari, just comes in just a little bit late, according to the official, and gives Texas A&M an extra 15 yards. Kwame Etwi with the run, his first carry. 83 points. 1,000 yards, the first three quarters of the belt ball. What's in store after this? 42-41, Texas A&M knocking on the door. These teams are combined 1,000 yards plus in the first three quarters. Starkle, Kirk, and he's out of bounds inside the 10 off the block from Osborne. Looked like some early movement, but Duke Edgefor didn't care. Keith Ford ripped back by the redshirt senior for Wake Forest. It did look like there was some early movement, and that play wasn't really well organized from the beginning. It was going to be a power play running with Etwe, and Edgefor was having none of it and blew that up via penetration early. Ford had had... A very strong drive. Now second down and goal. Ford, the tailback. Here is Ford. Sidestepping. And let's see. What are they going to say? No signal of touchdown yet. Tanner Shorp is the tight the end. Short of the goal line. There's an injured defender. Wow. And then Keith Ford was running behind the block of Shorp, and it looked like to me. That's a touchdown. That's a Kelly. touchdown. The backside doesn't come down until the ball had crossed the very front of that goal line, and I think that's a touchdown. It was somewhat deceiving initially, Jason, because it looked like Jason or Keith Ford was going down on the back side. The first thing was going to be his buttocks that hit, but right there he pushes off, and as the butt comes down, I think the ball is just getting across the front of that plane, and that's all it takes. The ball doesn't have to be into the end zone. It just has to be across the front of that white line. A portion of the ball has to be across a portion of the white line. Exactly. That's all there is to it. And If we can go back, and we stopped it just a little bit too soon because the backside of Keith Ford was not down. That's going to be very close. Tough to overturn, yes. though, right? Yes. 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 So now it's under review, but you need indisputable video evidence to overturn the call. Yeah, and we've talked about that all year for a few years now. It's so important how it's originally called on the field because that, that standard indisputable video evidence it takes to overturn something on the field. I don't know that we had it on those replays, to be honest with you. Especially on plays right down the goal line. It's very difficult to tell where the ball connects with the white line that makes for the goal line. So, plays under review. 
It would be third down and goal if not a touchdown. Dave Clawson watching. Yeah, I, I, I don't know that you can overturn it based no. on anything we've seen. And that's nothing against the looks. It's simply yeah. it's a very difficult call to make. And the replay booth is seeing what we're seeing, seeing what you're seeing at home. They have the same looks. They have the ability to start and stop and freeze and magnify the look and all those things. And at the end of the day, I don't know that there's enough there to overturn it. Ruling on the field, so the runner was spun backwards, and he was ruled that he was down before the ball crossed. That ruling stands. Yeah, that's the right call based on what yeah. we saw, don't you think? Yeah, and that's why he didn't say confirm, because there's nothing there to confirm anything. So it has to stand as it was called on the field. And the officials do such a good job with that, typically. I mean, it's real time. So many things are happening. And the vast majority of the time, an overwhelming majority of the time, they got it right to begin with. See if they feed Ford again. Ford, knock back. Well, they fed Ford again, Jason, but they forgot to block Jabari Williams coming off the edge. The buck linebacker, the weak linebacker, just slices to the running back because basically that's all he has to do on a goal line play and blew that play up before it could get going. So Wake Forest forces the field goal attempt from 20 for La Camera. Sevens are bad, threes are not bad. Threes are good defensively this day and age in college football. La Camera swings it through. 45-41, Texas A&M with the lead, early fourth quarter. One thousand twenty-two yards in the Belk Bowl, but coming up four forty Eastern time on ESPN two. Don't forget, we have the Franklin American Mortgage Music City Bowl. That was supposed to be on immediately following our game. <laughs> when is that going to happen? We've gotten in the way. 148 plays, 86 points, 1,000 plus All yards. All good stuff. All good stuff. Wake has 72 plays and AM 76. We're still on pace to get to that magical 90 play mark. Wade on the return. Chuck Wade to the edge and out of bounds across the 30. So coming up, as we were talking about, Clayton Thorson and that Northwestern team, Pat Fitzgerald, has his cats to take on the Kentucky Wildcats, the Franklin American Mortgage Music City Bowl, 440 Eastern on ESPN2. That's when that game starts and where it starts. And then when our game comes to an end, roughly 8 p.m., <laughs> we will see that game move over to ESPN. It'll be a good game. Two teams that... Uh, are not traditionally known as big time football powers, but we saw Northwestern earlier this year in a very tight one with Iowa. Wolford was injured earlier and now he takes off and runs. He gets the first down and gets licked by Tucker and Jones. So no worse for the wear that time, uh, John Wolford. And that's a part of the Wake Forest offense we didn't see much through the first three quarters is the actual designed quarterback runs. Wolford hands it off this time. Colburn down the sideline and hopping inside for a first down. Jason, it was Wolford's right ankle that got rolled up on. He did not have to receive any treatment, however. And he is on the field looking pretty good. They're going to move Colburn back, and that play was 
not great looking from the get go. He gets to the 40 yard line, it's a second down. Matt Colburn, who Dave Clawson said he, he came in very immature. He was kind of just out there to run, didn't know pass protection and things like that. He has been the big time ball carrier today for Wake Forest. And there's the tight end, Cam Serene, who's just a yard short of the marker. Larry Pryor is the injured party for AM. Larry Pryor, one of those Texas AM safeties that has had to play in a depleted back end for Texas AM. Armani Watts has been out, and Tucker didn't play the first half. And we'll see how Larry Pryor is doing when we come back after this break. The Belt Bowl, brought to you by Bell, the home of modern Southern style. Visit belt.com today. Franklin American Mortgage. It all begins with home. And the Lexus December to Remember sales event, now through January 2nd. That's Texas A&M pit crew at the NASCAR Hall of Fame. Not only can you play video games, but you can see how long it takes to make a pit stop. What what job would you take if you were the, the pit stop crew I'm member that sure. you wanted never, to be? Never really been asked that question. Well, we have time. 1130. We do have a little time, don't we? This is a run for John Wolford, and he goes straight ahead. For the first down, a lot to do here in Charlotte. We showed you uh, the driving that the players got to do at the Motor Speedway in the area. NASCAR Hall of Fame. First down for Wake Forest. Wolford, throwback, Scotty Washington. A nice play by Renfro to sniff that out, second down. And Jason, right now, Texas A&M has three true freshmen, Renfro, Tucker, and Carper on the back end in there together. I would think that Wake Forest wants to get someone vertically, especially your tight end in Cam Serenay, and see if those youngsters can cover somebody. This is a run, and Colburn darting inside. What an agile run for Colburn inside the 10. And or give it to an elusive, shifty runner in Colburn and have him leave one of those freshmen in his wake. Renfro misses the tackle, and about three other guys on Texas A&M's defense. One is right there. That's the freshman Renfro that comes up from his corner position and misses. And, and now Jayburn stays down after that hit. That is uh, stage name, Matt Colburn, who wants a singing career after his collegiate football career. Just a junior out of the state of South Carolina. He is down. Cade Carney has dealt with a knee injury for quite a bit of the year. We saw him very briefly in this game, but you would imagine based on carries today, Arkeem Bird would be the reserve for Colburn. Yeah, and Arkeem Bird is more like Colburn than Carney is. Carney is kind of a bowling ball with elbows and knees and is a downhill physical guy. What you need to replace Colburn with, if indeed you have to, is a guy that's shiftier, and Bird is more that guy, a little more speed, a little more elusiveness. Wake Forest already down Cortez Lewis with an Achilles injury, the wide receiver. Colburn injured and first and goal coming up for Wake Forest. Kentucky and Northwestern, if you're waiting for that, the Franklin American Mortgage Music City Bowl is a 440 start time on ESPN2. Stephen Johnson in Kentucky trying to get the Wildcats a bowl victory against Pat's Cats in Nashville. Pat's Cats. Pat's Cats. Northwestern alum, Pat Fitzgerald. Bet he doesn't get the same amount of text messages in Kentucky week as he did in Iowa week. Pat Fitzgerald, <laughs> <That's right. laughs> one of our favorites to talk to this week, uh, this year in, in our weekly conversations with college football coaches. As Colburn comes off. 
So uh, 1,000 and roughly 80 yards, uh, about seven yards of play combined. So that's not bad. Really exciting. And then uh, each team's basically had the ball an equal amount. Cade Carney comes in for Wake Forest. First and goal. Carney up the middle, driving the legs. And Carney inside the five-yard line. That's who Carney is right there on that run. You saw it front and center. Find a go, uh, unblocked guy in the hole and just get extra yards after contact. Carney seeking the outside, and you just described him as a runner. That's not his type of run. No. The first run... An unblocked defender in the hole, and he still gets positive yards, but you don't want Carney to make a living going laterally, which that last play was, and AM m is typically going to eat that one up. Carney up the middle, and he's knocked back. So a young man who 10 years ago would have been on his couch watching or in the stadium watching this bowl game, a huge Wake fan, can't get in for the Deeks on third and goal. You going for it? You go for it right here, right? Fourth and maybe just a skosh inside a one. Wolford is a great ball handler and a runner with the football, and Carney is very physical at going downhill. Wolford, the pitch. Carney scores! Touchdown, Wake Forest! You know how to fool a defense? How's that? Run a speed option with a bowling ball that's going laterally as Kate Carney is. He's a downhill in the box type of guy that is a warrior and is hampered by a knee injury and has been most of this year. Instead, Wake runs a speed option and Wolford goes to the end man on the line of scrimmage and runs an option off of him and ends up pitching it to Carney, who has enough to get in the end zone. Landis Durham being helped off the field for AM defensively, but Weaver trying to make it a three point game with the extra point. Weaver makes the extra point. So Cade Carney comes in for the injured Matt Colburn. And on fourth down, Carney off the pitch from Wolford gets him in. And look, you called him a bowling ball. In the celebration, Scotty Washington picked up too heavy of a bowling ball. He's got to go lighter next time. Wake Forest and Texas A&M have had a rather fun day in the Queen City of North Carolina offensively. And Mike Weaver to give it right back to the Aggies after the touchdown from Carney. Keith Ford. Just short of the 30-yard line for A&M. Kentucky Northwestern just kicked off. That game is currently on ESPN2. The Franklin American Mortgage Music City Bowl is underway. That game will be on ESPN following our 48-45 current affair. Nine minutes to go. So if you're looking for that game, you'll find it immediately following our game and also right now on ESPN2. But that's the greatest reason to have the ESPN app right now. And there you go. You can watch that's both. That's your answer. Pick which one to mute. I we wondered won't. when you were going to get there, but <laughs> that's exactly it. Thank you. Starkle for Christian Kirk, who was injured earlier, but has shown no ill effects of that. So second down coming up. This kid's going to be fun to watch on Sundays. On the ground, and Etwi with a first down running over Cameron Glenn. So Noel Mazzoni hasn't really uncorked no, the trick plays yet. don't forget that. It's never too late to un uncork one of those trick plays. Starkle off the pump. 
to the sideline. He's on target for another first down, and Kendrick Rogers inside of Wake Forest territory doing the old wheelbarrow act as Williams tried to yank it away from him. First down. And that was a great adjustment by Rogers because that was going to be the fake now screen outside, and then Rogers was going to go vertical, but he actually set it in the void, set in the void, seeing the corner D. Kirk. Bates overran it and recovered well. Yeah, Bates got a little greedy. He was trying to jump between Starkle, the quarterback, throwing the now or quick screen to Christian Kirk outside and then reverse field and was able to get a hold of a shifty Chris, Christian Kirk. Career high 13 catches for Kirk and good closing speed by Jesse Bates. Yeah, to recover. no doubt. Jamon Osmond, the freshman for a Texas A&M first down. I, these quarterbacks are going to be sad to see this game go. Yeah, and that kind of throw has been there all day for Texas A&M. Wake Forest defensively is playing softer on the edges, which Noel Mazzoni was looking forward to that matchup with his young receiving core as opposed to the grown men that press coverage in the SEC that they saw week after week. He drew a comparison to that UCLA team they saw in week one. Starkle overthrown, nearly intercepted by Bates. Ratley was running a sluggo, a slant and go, and that was dead on arrival. And Nick Starkle almost got into trouble because he allowed the safety Jesse Bates as you called his name because Bates came out of the middle of the field and got clear over there to get a hand on that football. That was dead and should have been thrown into the third row right away. Jesse Bates who has a knack for fighting the football. It's a throw to Ford. There's nobody with him. Edge of four had a thought about going out there together with Ford, then just kind of hung up in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, that's a great point. And Texas A&M has used that wide motion by the running back a lot this year. And you see how the defense adjusts to it, and then you throw accordingly. And Keith Ford, like you said, was all by himself. Ford to the short side, and he's wrangled down. Right at the 20 yard line Keith Ford the senior out of Cypress Texas sometimes with that wide running back motion what you'll get is you'll get the coverage bumping and a lesser coverage guy on a really shifty slot receiver and your best corner covering your running back outside but that time Wake Forest just completely dropped coverage on the running back and it is Ford that's injured Nick Starkle. Walking to the sideline to huddle his troops Ford, the senior running back is down three point game. The progressive bowl challenge cup is here and will be awarded to the conference that has the highest winning percentage in the postseason bowl challenge cup. Showing the Big Ten up to three and O's so far. That'll get challenged tonight with USC and Ohio State in the Goodyear Cotton Bowl Classic later on. Sunbelt only one loss. As Texas A&M is rapping on the door. Etwi the tailback. As this one goes to the tight end for A&M and it's Tanner Short. Typical blocking tight end who Noel Mazzoni said felt like he turned into Gronk or at least Tanner thought so after a catch <laughs> against LSU. The game he had like three catches. Yeah, it's, it was, it's half his catches on the year. It's a career day for Tanner. Third down and three and you might think about kicking the field goal depending on how this goes. Probably likely that Banks would go there but. Time out before we can see the third down play. So this is timeout Wake Forest 48 45 your score New Year's Day the college football playoff semifinals on ESPN Oklahoma and Georgia and then Clemson Alabama heard Reese Davis talking about it Baker Mayfield a little bit under the weather will he play that's the question. Five Eastern two Pacific it starts I mean, look at those games on the ESPN app numbers are just off the hook every time he. 
attempts a pass. It's almost 12 yards. It's just incredible. 41 touchdown passes, five picks. And then, oh, by the way, every time a play breaks down, he extends it for about half a day and makes something good happen. What a tremendous player he's become. You know, picking the Heisman winner between him and Lamar Jackson and what they can do on the field is yeah. almost unfair considering how dynamic they both are. But you got to pick one, and Mayfield was it. Third and three for AM and Starkle. To throw. Touchdown! Osborne got in! Freshman on freshman, Osborne beats Taylor. And this is by formation. It's a three by one set. Three receivers to the left. Osborne by his lonesome on the right side. And so basically what Starkle does is if he has man to man on my sing on the single receiver, I go ahead and take him. And Osborne beats the other freshman and ends up in the end zone. What will happen next in this game? Three blocked kicks. Each team has led by at least 14. Four lead changes. 5.52 to go. You've stood the whole game. Should I get you a, a chair? Are you doing all right over there? I might just sleep this for 36 is hours. Be a while. I guarantee you that John Wolford's not done as he gets the ball back. I, I mean, it could be two possessions for each team still left. Fast Eddie, how many plays we up to per team? Because remember, one of our keys to the game was the first team to 90 plays, and they were on pace for about 96 apiece. Wake Forest has 83, AM has 86. Is that his nickname, Fast Eddie? Fast Eddie. Ed Spita. Always on time. Okay. So they say basketball is a game of runs. 31 unanswered for Wake. 38 to 17 for AM on its current run. You think the interim head coach, Jeff Banks, is fired up? Look at that focus on the sideline. How about the interim head coach kicking an onside kick right here? Oh. <laughs> he is a former punter. You know that, right? That would not be, that would not go over well. Chuck Wade on the return couldn't squeeze through the hole to make any more of it but he does get to the 30 yard line and don't forget on ESPN 2 right now Northwestern and Kentucky the Franklin American Mortgage Music City Bowl that's coming up on ESPN when we are finished whenever that might be currently on ESPN 2 and Kentucky has taken the lead seven to nothing but they've got a long way to go to get to a hundred points out in Nashville. So the last act in the play about John Wolford. He hands off to Colburn who's back in and turned around. Landis Durham has had quite the game from the defensive end spot for AM. Yeah, and you have to wonder why Wake Forest is running the football, but remember, you don't know what the play is in a run pass option until the quarterback reads the defense. Wolford, quick set, high throw, and it is caught by Scotty Washington, who they do give the first down to, though it was close as Miles Jones wrapped him up. And Wolford has been very hot throwing the football, so if you want him to throw it, you have to take the run pass option away and just call pass plays, and you have to do that if you're running the football in a run pass option at times. Wolford spiked down by Kingsley Kiki that time. And what I mean by that, Jason, is the defense can dictate who gets the ball in a run pass situation. They know who's being read, and they can turn it into a run as many times as they want. Bachman goes down to haul it in, first down. You remember what Paul Johnson told us when we had Georgia Tech earlier this year? He said, based on the triple option, I know what happened on the play based on who gets the ball. Exactly. Not that this is exactly the same, but it's the same concept. Very similar principles, however. Wolford goes deep. Incomplete. A lot of contact. Tabari Hines wanted a flag, and he's not going to get one. It goes 
in the direction of Antonio Howard, and it looked like there was a possibility of interference. Tabari Hines thought that Howard was holding him. That's the bottom line, and the officials disagreed with that. Wolford to the 40s, chopped down by Tucker, the freshman who's only played the second half because of targeting in the last game. Wolford is sneaky good in the quarterback design runs. Just blows it up, messy. That was, here comes the 90th play by Wake Forest in this game. It's a third down play, and it's a first down grab for the Demon Deacons. Renfro still battling there. But he cannot crowbar it free from Wake Forest, Scotty Washington. Great throw, great catch, and tremendous coverage by Rimfro. Pump and go. Sideline, Serenay with nobody in the zip code. Serenay, such a smart receiver. Bachman was the vertical part of that pump and go, and then the big tight end just sets down outside in that in that fade area, and his quarterback, Wolford, finds it. Tunneling through inside the 15, so Belk Bowl records in points, plays, and yards, and it's going to take some more of all of them for Wake Forest to take a win. Ten years ago, the Demon Deacons won this game against Connecticut with Riley Skinner at Jacksonville quarterback at the helm. Coburn! First and goal, Demon Deacons. That's where you see that extra burst that Colburn brings that Cade Carney does not. You get to the edge, and then that's that extra gear that Colburn has that this Wake Forest run game has benefited from. How wiped is this defense right now? Absolutely gassed. Seconds. And that's why AM burns a timeout. The highest scoring bowl game is the GMAC Bowl in 2001. And I don't know that we're going to get there. Marshall 64, East Carolina 61. But this is right up there with the best of them. We're only 25 points away from that. We still have three minutes and 17 seconds left. And whenever post game is, you can tune into ESPN3 for the post game trophy ceremony presented by Capital One. It immediately follows the game. 317 in game time remaining, but maybe eons of football, depending on whether or not we can find an equalizer out of Wake Forest and AM. Well, if you're Wake, you have to figure out how you're going to close this drive out. You're right. Texas AM defensively is absolutely gassed. Their reserves are completely gone in those longs, and John Walford is trying to fade it, find a way to get this one in the end zone. Serenay, the dangerous tight end, close to the formation, on the bottom of the formation. Just short, down to the one. Serenay was the lead blocker from that left wing, comes back up inside, and essentially leads the quarterback, John Walford, right up to the goal line. I don't think Walford's right right no, now. No, he isn't. Chris told us it was that right ankle earlier in the game, and this time it seems like he's limping on his left. This has to be a run for Colburn, right? I would think so. I don't think you're going to see Walford keep it. Colburn got twisted around, and he's down short of the line. Third and goal coming up. Cunningham the stop. I think more of the same, Jason. Because of the injury and or because could, it's the right call? Both, and you can go two times, remember. Colburn, outside, touchdown! That was the same play. Just essentially a dive by Colburn right up the middle, but it's the bounce outside. That's the speed and elusiveness that Colburn brings to this Wake Forest run game. Nothing inside, but a massive humanity, and all of a sudden, 22 Colburn bounces it outside, but then the key is have the speed to make it pay off, and 22 Colburn has that. 13 plays in 334, nearly 70 yards on the drive. 
The question is, did you leave Texas A&M too much time with 218 and two timeouts? The answer is, will A&M leave too much that, time for Wake Forest? That is a great point. And the answer may be yes. Just a friendly game of make it, take it right now between Wake Forest and Texas A&M. Tonight, Sports Center SVP after that big USC Ohio State game. Sam Darnold, what's he going to do in the NFL? Where could he go if it is his final college game? Tonight, Kirk Herb Street on Ohio State's year, and then uh, the funniest and unique moments for SVP. And one of them has got to be the offense from the Belt Bowl here today. Uh, 107 points, yardage through the roof and plays as well points total plays total yards and two defensive coordinators that want this game to end <laughs> they've wanted that for yeah. quarters <laughs> wake forest by the way in its last men's basketball game scored 60 so danny manning may want to check into cam serenade's availability it's not a bad Just idea a couple of weeks He's a good 6'3", and it can go up and get it at its high point. A&M with 2.18 to go gets it back. Keith Ford. To the 20, and that's all. So a long field. Time for the Capital One player of the game, and it is the senior quarterback who's gotten so we dynamic. Begin the show with him, and he is not disappointed whatsoever. The improvement that this young man has made between the last time we saw him at the end of last season and through today has been one of the biggest and best turnarounds I've seen in college football, maybe any level of football, and kudos to that young man right there. From the same city as Riley Skinner, does he have a win for Wake Forest? Dunn got there, and a big hit by Cernod immediately on Ford. And Cernod is staying down after that contact. I think the players right now, just everything and some things they didn't even know they owned are starting to cramp up. It's a good way of putting it. Two minutes exactly. Second and eight after the injury to Sternod, who's going to play a big role, you'd imagine, in that linebacking core. They lose Lee and Brown last year. Williams and Dawson will leave, both seniors. Kemper Redshirt Jr. And who knows? We may actually take you right up to USC Ohio State. You <laughs> That's going to be a good one. Never know. Uh, Kentucky and Northwestern, if you're looking for it, is right now on ESPN2. But who wins between Sam Darnold and that Ohio State defense, really? I, I, I don't care. I just want to watch the yeah. game. <laughs> I mean, that's going to be tremendous. I think both quarterbacks are going to, I think, be lights out. Defense for USC that has improved as the year's gone on. And Todd McShay said about eight potential draft picks on defense for Ohio State. That's going to be a good one. Second and eight, A&M. Kirk in motion. Starkle loads it up and finds Osborne across the 30. First down, clock will stop. And Jason, the order of the day, it's a prototypical two-minute situation. Two timeouts left, about a minute 40. You just cannot take a sack if you're the quarterback. Starkle, the freshman, off the screen. Etwe to the 42. Wendell Dunn with the hit in his final game for Wake Forest. Sense of urgency. Take what's there if you're the quarterback. Keep the sticks moving. Plenty of time left. And again, two timeouts for Texas A&M. Starkle. Osborne catches and falls. First down for A&M. Short of the 50, but not by much. And remember, LaCamera does have a 52-yarder, the kicker for A&M, but he's only one for three from 50 yards plus this year. Under a minute.
Starkel, deep ball. Osben is dragged down by Isang Bassi, and no flag. Was it catchable? Wow, Golly, he got ripped down. No doubt. Osben is going on the post route, a double post, and there isn't any question about it. Bassey got there early. That's quintessential pass interference. A&M has taken the short passes. They went deep that time and couldn't pay it off in part because of the contact. And Texas A&M draws a flag. Play Delay clock game. hits zero. Offense, five yard penalty, second down. Oh my goodness, a team that's shown no signs of being under new management with Banks the interim coach today. Finally one shows up. And just trying to do too much. Trying to move guys around and guys didn't know where they were supposed to go and it led to going backwards for Texas A&M offensively. Second and 15, the rush got there. Etwe gets hit and dropped. Boy, Duke Edgefor was very quickly in there on Starkle. One timeout remaining for Texas A&M. Please reset the game clock to 39 Upon use seconds. of that one. Please. Yeah, not really good offense the last couple of plays to say the least. You burn the play clock and then you throw to a running back inbounds that isn't going to get much and then it gets tackled and keeps the clock moving. Those things don't work well in the two minute, short minute, short time situation. So how does your former coach, Noel Mazzoni, call two plays at most to get your 14 yards here? Yeah, well, first of all, you still have a timeout. So the middle of the field is in play. It's going to stop a bit if you convert and move the chains. And you have to find your best player on the field, which is still number three, Christian Kirk, who's the slot to the top side of the field in the trips formation. Starkle looks the other way and incomplete. Osborne, the target. Edge of four got in there with pressure. And that's the thing right there. Edge of four has been a consistent disruptor in this game and really his entire career. So it comes down to this. Fourth and 15, I still need to find Christian Kirk in the middle of the field against a depleted secondary for Wake Forest. Fourth down. Starkle with time. Incomplete. Wake Forest hangs on. Starkle a yard shy of 500 and 15 yards shy of a drive continuation. And Christian Kirk was no more than a decoy, went quickly to the flat with Radley coming into the middle of the field. And I think that the goal was to draw coverage to Christian Kirk in the flat and find some room for Radley in the middle, but very well defended on the back end for Wake Forest. The highest scoring offensive unit in Wake Forest history says farewell to its seniors with a 55 point avalanche down the road in Charlotte for Dave Clawson. score. Downstairs, Chris Button with Dave Clawson. Coach, 107 points. <laughs> what did it take to win this one? Well, it, it took the last play of the game, and credit to Texas A&M. You know, under the circumstances of an interim coach, they played their tails off, and, you know, we ended up making one more play. 
What can you say about the way that your seniors, there were some that got here before your tenure and then the ones in your first recruiting class and how they've changed the culture at Wake Forest football? I, I love them. I mean, uh, everything they've been through and they just, they worked through three and nine, three and nine, and now eight wins, two consecutive bowl wins. I just, those guys are winners. I'm so proud of them. I appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Dave Clawson gets another win in a bowl game, and this offense has just made such a turnaround in one year. It's unbelievable. It's hard to hard to put it in words. From Walfer all the down that receiving core, and kudos to them, but also Texas A&M. Interim situation. Those kids also played their tails off, as Coach Clawson just told us. Kelly, Chris, thank you for a great season. Our entire crew, wonderful to share it with you. And you, out in TV land, 55-52, your final score. Coming up next, Northwestern and Kentucky. Andre Ware, Taylor Zarzer, take it away.